Circuit Court is now in session with the Honorable Kwame Rowe presiding. Good afternoon. You may be seated. Good afternoon, Council. Appearances for the record. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Assistant Prosecutor Kelly Collins appearing on behalf of the people. Nice to see you. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Markeisha Washington appearing on behalf of the people. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Karen McDonald appearing on behalf of the people. Also, Mark Keese, who stepped up to the house. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Paulette Michelle Lofton on behalf of Mr. Crumbly, who's standing to my left. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Amy Hopp on behalf of Ethan Crumbly. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Deborah H. McKelvey, court appointed guardian of Lightham for Ethan Crumbly. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Council. You may be seated. As Council is aware, today's date and time set for a hearing under the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act. Purpose of this hearing is to determine solely where the defendant should be placed during the pendency of this case, whether or not he should be placed at the Oakland County Jail, or whether or not he should be returned to the Children's Village where the case initially started off at before he was charged as an adult. Uh, this case will be live streamed this afternoon because we only have limited capacity. There, We can only allow up to 20 people in the courtroom and we must maintain social distancing. I understand, Council, uh, you are all from the same office, so I don't believe there's any issue with that so long as you all don't have an issue. Same with defense, so long as you don't have any issue, I believe that it's appropriate for you all to be seated at council table. Pursuant to the Crime Victims Right Act, though, I cannot allow additional victims or anyone else into the courtroom because we could not have, we have limited capacity. So this will be live streamed so we can make sure that any victim or potential victim has an opportunity to see this hearing and be present if they wanted to be present via live stream. With that being said, is there any preliminary issues that we need to discuss? I do have some follow-up. As we alerted the court earlier today, I do have two proposed orders. One as a follow-up to our status conference this morning, as well as a renewed stipulation and order for a protective order with regard to this case. If I may approach your clerk with those. Please. I believe all attorneys have executed them. Your Honor, and the only other issue, uh, we would ask permission that my client's uh, right hand be uncuffed so that he could communicate uh, with us more effectively. I have no issue with that, with his right hand being uncuffed. Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. Your Honor, another request or, or inquiry I have is when we are questioning witnesses, are we permitted to remove our masks? Yes, so yeah. only people that will be allowed to remove their mask while in court today will be the attorney that's actually questioning the witness as well as the witness so all answers could be accurately recorded. Understood. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, we just have a couple of other matters to present to the court that relate to the hearing itself. Um, we have had an opportunity to discuss this matter between the parties. Uh, we anticipate a, a total of three witnesses this afternoon at this hearing. We also have discussed that this uh, placement review hearing is a miscellaneous proceeding under um, MCR, or I'm sorry, MRE 1101B3, and as such, that the rules of evidence do not apply. Um, we have created an exhibit list and an exhibit binder. The court should be in receipt of that. It contains 18 exhibits on behalf of the people, one exhibit um, on behalf of the defense. You'll note that the people's exhibits are numbered and the defense exhibit is uh, is defendant uh, exhibit A. The parties have discussed these exhibits um, and agreed that they truly should only be viewed in camera by the court um, at this time. Some of these exhibits do contain sensitive information. Some of that is sensitive particular to the defendant himself. Other information is sensitive for other juveniles. Most of the exhibits are in written form. Um, the court will note that when you have the opportunity to review them but there are three videos that the court is being asked to review before making a decision. Those three videos were made in a shed just outside of the defendant's home. 
One of them, which depicts the prolonged mutilation and torture of a bird, accompanied by audio that the viewer will likely find very disturbing. Um, there's also a separate picture of a severed bird head, a separate bird um, that is discussed within one of the other exhibits we have coined the defendant's journal, um, or labeled as the defendant's journal. Um, I want to assure the court we are not undertaking the introduction of these exhibits lightly. Um, we think that they're absolutely necessary for the court to review in making such a decision as you're called upon to make during this hearing. And um, we simply want the court to be prepared before viewing that material. So, Thank you, um, Ms. Cohn. At this time, though, by way of stipulation, we are asking that the court officially admit these exhibits. It's People's Exhibits 1 through 18 and Defendant's Exhibit A um, into the record. That Ms. is Lord. correct. Thank you. Exhibits, People's Exhibits 1 through 18 will be admitted as People's 1 through 18. Defendant's Exhibit A is admitted as Defendant's Exhibit A. Are there any other preliminary issues? I believe that uh, is all I have to present at this time. Mm -hmm. Nothing further from defense. Okay. And people, when you are prepared, please call your first witness. Your Honor, may we make a brief opening statement? Sure. This matter is before the court today to fulfill the requirements as set forth in a newly enacted statute, that being the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act, which makes federal funding available for states regarding the, de excuse me, the detention and confinement of certain juveniles. Today, we ask this court to enter an order requiring that the defendant remain confined in the Oakland County Jail. When a juvenile is charged as an adult, MCR 6.909 subsection B subsection 2 allows that juvenile to be confined in an adult facility if A, the juvenile's conduct or habits are considered a menace to other juveniles, or B, if the juvenile cannot otherwise be detained safely in a juvenile detention facility. Likewise, MCL 764.27A subsection 3 expressly provides that a juvenile who is under the jurisdiction of a court for committing a felony offense may be held in the county jail pending trial. As the court noted earlier, neither the court rule nor the statute at issue today. Accordingly, we look to the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act, specifically 34-111-33, which allows for housing of juveniles in adult facilities if after a hearing and in writing the court finds that such placement is, quote, in the interest of justice, end quote. The statute further outlines the factors for which this court must consider in determining what interest of justice factors should be considered in regarding the placement. Those factors include, one, the age of the juvenile, two, the physical and mental maturity of the juvenile, three, the mental state of the juvenile, including whether the juvenile presents an imminent risk of harm to himself. Four, the nature and circumstance of the alleged offense. Five, the juvenile's history of prior delinquent acts. Six, the relative ability of the available adult and juvenile detention facilities to not only meet the specific needs of the juvenile, but also to protect the public as well as other detained youth and seven, any other relevant factor. I will address a few of these factors very briefly. Regarding the defendant's age and mental maturity, the evidence will show that despite the defendant's biological age, he discussed topics and interests well beyond that of an average 15-year-old. In a text read with his friend and in his journal, he outlined a plan to stalk, rape, torture, and ultimately kill a female classmate. He expressed delight in torturing a family of baby birds. And he wrote about the joy he received in listening to them squeal as he killed them. He spoke of his admiration for Adolf Hitler and Jeffrey Dahmer, specifically stating, when you die, you need to be remembered for a long time, doing something that will make people think of you until time ends. 
The evidence will show that the defendant had a very specific and detailed agenda leading up to November 30th. His journal, in his journal, excuse me, he described the type of gun he needed, who his first victim would be, and ultimately he expressed that he would surrender so that he could witness the pain and suffering that he caused. This shows a sophistication beyond that of an average 15-year-old. The defendant's journal has been admitted for an in-camera review as we believe the entire content must be considered when determining what is in the interest of justice. The court must also consider the nature and circumstance of the alleged offense. This court is well aware of the horrific event that happened on November 30th. However, now the court has an opportunity to review and see just how calculated and methodic this defendant was. The people, again, have admitted for an in-camera review a video that was retrieved from the defendant's phone the night before the shooting. In the video, the defendant identifies himself as the next school shooter. And in, a, in, in an unfathomable way, he attempts to justify his future actions. To place this defendant with other at-risk juveniles who are presumably the same age as his victims would be contrary to the rehabilitation of those at Children's Village and pose a potential risk of harm to their safety. Another factor that the court must consider is the prior delinquent acts of this juvenile. As stated in the People's Brief, despite having no documented juvenile history, the defendant's antisocial behavior is very concerning. The evidence will show that he bragged about wearing a mask to the public. He enjoyed his dark side. The defendant isn't who he appears to be. He allows people to see who he wants them to see, and only those close to him, such as his parents, would understand or recognize it. He is fascinated with violence, weapons, and seeing others suffer. He cunningly placed a bird in the boys' bathroom at Oxford High School, and in his journal, he let her revel, excuse me, reveled about how happy he was for not getting caught. His behavior, however, continued to escalate. And when the defendant committed those premeditated murders on November 30th, he did so with the intent to be remembered, to terrorize a community, and to gain recognition. Pursuant to the statute, the court is also allowed to consider other relevant factors. The evidence will show that despite the Oakland County, excuse me, despite the defendant being held in the Oakland County Jail, he is not completely isolated. He has the ability to watch television. He has access to a tablet wherein he can communicate with family and friends. He can play games and he can read books, all of which he's taken advantage of. He has phone privileges. He receives mail and he has a commissary account. Since his placement in the Oakland County Jail, he has been monitored every 15 minutes, and any issues or concerns that have been brought regarding his care have been taken care of expeditiously and will continue to be addressed at that same level of efficiency. In conclusion, it is important to note that the statute in question specifically emphasizes that the court is to consider what is in the interest of justice not what is in the best interest of the juvenile. Thus, it is the people's position that it is the defendant's current placement in the Oakland County Jail that is best suited to meet his specific needs, to maintain and protect the safety of the general public, as well as to protect the juveniles at Children's Village. Hence, we believe it is in the interest of justice that he be confined in the Oakland County Jail. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Washington. Ms. Lofton? Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, defense completely understands the serious nature of the charges that Mr. Crumbly has been charged with. Um, but the statutes that were quoted um, and the JG, JJDPA um, that sets out the guidelines for this hearing tell the court to look at other things, not just specifically the charges and the events of that day. Ms. Hott, myself, um, and Ms. McKelvey have, have had the pleasure of meeting Mr. Crumbly at least 12 times. Um, the prosecutor is arguing from a place of what they see in black and white, what they see on his phone, 
All of these events obviously transpired prior uh, to my client being charged. I think it's going to be very important for the court to look at what's happened since he has been charged. And that's the questions that we will be asking of the witnesses today. Because the factors that are laid out uh, for the court to consider, as I stated, only one part of those factors are the allegations and the events surrounding the charges. There are a number of other things that the court must look at. I believe that the evidence will show uh, that in the time leading up to these events that my client um, was hallucinating, that he was seeing things, he was hearing voices, he was not sleeping, he was extremely anxious, he was not eating properly, and that he had asked his parents to see a therapist. And at the time of this event, my client was not in any sort of therapy. As to the isolation, Your Honor, we will be arguing that the appropriate placement uh, for Mr. Crumbly is at the Children's Village. He is being housed currently in uh, the clinic facility in the Oakland County Jail. It is essentially a cement cell with a glass door. Um, and because the rule is that he has to be out of sight and sound from adults, he has very little interaction with anyone. So yes, there is a deputy that peers in at him every 15 minutes and signs off that he is doing what he needs to be doing and that he's safe. Um, but our testimony will be that this extreme isolation is actually not beneficial whatsoever and actually harms Mr. Crumbly. Yes, he has access to a tablet a couple of hours a day. It's not something that is housed in his cell with him all the time. Um, he does have access to a phone, but unfortunately Mr. Crumbly does not have the numbers of any family members, so he's not utilized the phone whatsoever. Um, the tablet is set up for communication, so strangers email Mr. Crumbly, and he has the ability to respond to those emails. I do not think that is enough um, to argue that he is not being isolated. Um, he interacts with a caseworker, he interacts with a psychiatrist one time per week for minutes. Other than that, if he's not meeting with myself, Ms. Hopp, or Ms. McKelvey, he's not interacting with anyone except when they're handing him his tray of food. We will be arguing uh, that the jail is not equipped with handling juveniles um, in respect to any type of activity. He does not leave his cell whatsoever. He has, and I know that there are protocols because of COVID and most inmates are not receiving any type of rec um, or gym time, but he is essentially not leaving his cell at all, except for a shower or if he's being moved to a visitation booth to visit myself um, or one of the other counsels. So at the close of this hearing, Your Honor, we will be asking that he be moved to Children's Village. I do think that is an appropriate place for him. There are other juveniles charged with murder that are housed in that facility. This would not be the first time. Um, and we feel that due to his age being 15, and although he is educated and a very bright young, young man, I still think the appropriate placement for him is at Children's Village. Thank you, Ms. Walker. Thank you. People, you may call your first witness. Yes, sir. The people call Ms. Christina Bellin. Thank you. And my staff, because they're being actually kept in another courtroom away from uh, the public, and so my staff is just going to go grab the individual and bring them to the court. Thank you. Ms. Christina Belling.
consideration right now. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth on the penalty of perjury? Thank you. And ma'am, if you could just keep your voice up for me. Please yeah. have a seat. And ma'am, you may remove your mask if you're comfortable. People, your witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Before we begin, Your Honor, I, I did want to make the court aware that for purposes of this hearing, we would not, the people would not be referring to the defendant or the individual charged in this case by name. We will only be referring to him as a defendant, as we believe that there is good evidence to support the fact that in um, the notoriety um, could also encourage future school shootings. Understood. So noted. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Ma'am, please state and spell your last name. Belling, B-E-L-L-I-N-G. And your first name? Christina. And are you currently employed? Yes. Where are you employed? Oakland County Sheriff's Office. And in what capacity are you employed at the Sheriff's Department? I'm a caseworker, inmate caseworker. And how long have you been employed at the Sheriff's Department? 22 years. And have you been employed there as a caseworker for 22 years? No, I started out the first year as um, a booking clerk, 12 years as a deputy, and nine years as a caseworker. Mm -hmm. And can you briefly describe for the court what it is, uh, what your job responsibilities are as a caseworker? It's very multifaceted, but uh, the most important part of this is that we assess and manage the crisis that come into the jail. Um, a crisis can be something such as a high profile case, somebody who's currently suicidal, actively psychotic, or somebody that has suicidal or homicidal ideations. We then work in combination, if needed, with medical and the psychiatrist to get services. And then after their behaviors become manageable, then we continue to work with them to continue to assess any kind of mental health changes as well as adjustments into the jail. In order to be a, a caseworker, where, what is your educational background? Um, I have a master's degree from Oakland University and a licensure through the state of Michigan. It's an LPC, a licensed professional counselor. Okay. And are you required to do any continuing education? Yes. And do you, in fact, do that? Yes, I do. And are you current on that? Yes. Can you briefly describe, um, you said a license of professional counseling, is that correct? Yes. Is there a specific, um, like a, a, a specialization for adolescent or juvenile counseling that one could obtain? Not to my knowledge, no. Can you describe for the court exactly what um, avenues you have to, when you, when you obtained your um, license? Strike that. Sorry. In regards to your your specific title as a licensed professional counselor. Are you in the community or are you in the school? I'm the community. And what is the difference between the two? Um, there are several different classes you take to choose the school route. When you go into your master's program, you have to choose that you want to work with community or work with school. And are those are uh, community versus school, is that, is that the only two options? Yes. So if, if a person wanted to specialize in adolescence or juvenile, is that even an option? Well, specialization is a little bit different than choosing an avenue of, of either community or um, the school. So as with school, they work as school counselors in your school settings. Um, community, then you can do family uh, um, specializations, but to my knowledge, there is no just juvenile specializations. Thank you. Now, in your capacity as a caseworker, have you had the opportunity to work with juveniles in the Oakland County Jail? Yes. And in your capacity as a caseworker, approximately how many juveniles would you say you've worked with in the past? If you know. Do you want my deputy years or do you want just as a caseworker? As a caseworker. Under 10. And are you currently assigned to the defendant? Are you the current caseworker for the defendant in this case? Yes, ma'am. When were you assigned to his case? The day he came in from my knowledge. Is that fair to say that would be December 1st? Uh, yes. And just for the record, that was December 1st of 2021? Yes, sir. Thank you. Do you recall how often you were meeting with the defendant when he initially arrived at the Oakland County Jail? Daily. 
multiple times a day or just once a day? There may have been a couple occasions where I met with them multiple times just to check in, but it was just mostly one time a day. And how long were those meetings? It can range anywhere from five, ten minutes and up. It depends on if there's things to cover. Okay. And what were the purpose of those meetings? Without getting to the specifics of his treatment, can you just give a general idea of what the purpose is when you do meet with inmates at the Oakland County Jail? I assess for mental health issues. Okay. As we sit here today um, on February 22nd, are you still meeting with him on a daily basis? Not on a daily basis, no. How often are you meeting with the defendant? Approximately twice a week. And when did that change? When he came off of a constant watch. And do you know when he came off constant watch? Maybe a month ago. When you say a month ago, would that be January of 2022? Yes, sir. If the defendant needed access to medical treatment for any reason whatsoever, would that treatment be available to him? Yes. Where exactly were you meeting with the defendant? In front of his cell door. And where is his cell door located? In the clinic. And approximately how many other people um, are located within that clinic area? Changes daily, but there's always a deputy that assists me for safety and security purposes. Okay. If the defendant required any other professional visits, such as that to a licensed psychologist, a licensed psychiatrist, or a licensed therapist, would that be available to him? Licensed psychiatrist, yes. Yeah. And to the best of your knowledge, would that, if it was deemed necessary, would that be in person or by some other means? If, currently with COVID, um, when any inmate in the jail is given access to the psychiatrist, it is done over video at this time. Is the defendant at any time ref uh, allowed to refuse meeting with you? Individuals may re not want to speak with me, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to attempt to speak with them. So is it fair to say you would meet with the defendant at this moment in time, two times a week, no matter what? Yes. Okay. Now on average- I'm sorry, Ms. Washington, when you yes. say this moment in time, can we just uh, give a time frame? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Meaning, since he's been taken off a constant watch, you've been meeting with him two times a week. That was your testimony, correct? To my best of my ability, of my knowledge, yes. Okay. How many other inmates are on your case load, if you know, roughly? I, honestly, 70-ish, maybe okay. more, maybe less, I'm not sure. Pre-COVID, it was probably more like 120. Do you meet with any of your other case, or excuse me, inmates two times a week? No, ma'am. And yet you meet with the defendant twice a week? Yes, ma'am. And why is that? Because of his housing and because he's a juvenile. One moment, Your Honor. Thank you. Nothing further from this witness, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Lofton Cross. Yes, thank you. Your Honor, I will have some questions and then Ms. Hopp will follow up if that's okay with the court. That works for me. Thank you. Alrighty, thank you. Ma'am, if I ask you something that you don't understand, just let me know and I'll try to ask it a different way, okay? Okay. Alrighty. Um, so you've stated that you have been in your position as a caseworker for nine years at the Oakland County Jail. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. 
Okay, were you assigned anywhere previously as a caseworker? Do you mean any other facility? Any other facility, that's correct. No. You stated that you had a master's. What is that master's in? Counseling. And you stated that you believe in your nine years of acting as a caseworker, um, you've had 10 juveniles assigned to you, is that correct? Yes, approximately. Okay, and over those nine years, how many adult inmates do you think you've had assigned to you? I could not even answer that, I do not know. Okay, but hundreds, thousands? Hundreds, hundreds, that could be thousands. How many juveniles do you currently supervise um, as a caseworker? Does that count people who have juvenile charges and are now adults, or just juveniles, anybody under the age of 18? I can clarify, anybody under the age of 18? Just one. Okay, Mr. Crumbly. Yes. All right. Now, you detailed um, that when he originally uh, was booked in, you were seeing him on a daily basis, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and you had mentioned different types of watches. I, I'm not sure if you said suicide watch, but I know you said constant watch. Are you the person who decides what type of watch the defendant is on? Yes. Okay. So when he initially came into the Oakland County Jail, uh, he was on suicide watch. Is that correct? He was on a constant watch. And can you describe to the court what that constant watch is? He has a deputy sitting outside observing his behavior 24-7 just to assure his safety and security. And because of the constant watch, there are certain things he can and cannot have in his cell. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So currently my client still has suicide blankets. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. But your testimony is that he is no longer on constant watch, is that correct? That is correct. The issuance of blankets is not within my jurisdiction. Okay. And your testimony was that you are currently seeing my client two times a week, is that what you said? Yes. Okay. Um, my client recalls that he sees you on Mondays of each week. Uh, do you recall what other day you see my client? Generally towards the end of the week. This week I was not there towards the end of the week. Okay. Um, do you keep records each time you interact with an inmate? Yes, I do. Okay. So the records would show that you were interacting with Mr. Crumbly two times a week since he has been removed from constant watch. Is that correct? Except for this week because of course. Okay. I understand. There are also other caseworkers, if I'm not around, like we have extended weekends, who will fill in. Okay. In your continuing education that you stated that you do, does any of that continuing education deal specifically with uh, juveniles? Not currently, no. And are you responsible um, for deciding when my client gets access to the tablet or how long he gets access to the tablet or is that somebody else's uh, decision making? Somebody else's. Okay. Currently, um, are you aware if the jail has any ability to have Mr. Crumbly exit his cell for any type of physical activity? That is not to my knowledge. And are you involved at all um, with the food delivery or the type of food that my client is being delivered? No. Okay. I have no further questions, but I know Ms. Hopp may have some. Thank you. Ms. Hopp. Are you familiar with the laptops or the tablets in the jail that Mr. Crumbly has access to? I see them, yes. Have you ever um, looked at them and what programs they have on them? I do not. And in addition to mental health access, physical health access, uh, do you have anything to do with access to education for him? I do not. 
and so you would not know whether he had access to any sort of education programming while he's in the jail? I work mental health only. And in your um, schooling, you mentioned the two avenues, community and school. Did you take at any courses in the school part of I that took, at all? I took community. Um, are you aware, even if it's not in your responsibilities, whether he's getting any type of educational services? I am not aware. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hopp. Any rebuttal? Just bring on. Do I get the question? Oh, my apologies, Mr. Kelby. You're sitting in the bag. My apologies. <laughs> Good afternoon, Ms. Belling. Good afternoon. Just a couple of questions. Um, what's the makeup of the clinic in relation to cell location? Um, he's in an individual cell, correct? Yes, ma'am. And the gla there's a half glass door? Yes, that and looks forward. Okay, and if he looked out that door, what would be there? Maybe medical staff walking by. But a wall? Or Yes, oh, okay. there's also a TV. Out, right outside the door? Yes, right up towards on the ceiling. So he does he have control of, of that? I do not that, know. That's I not part not of anything you'd be involved in? No. Do you know, um, was he seen at any time by a psychiatrist while you have been? I cannot answer that. That's privileged information. And generally speaking, if he had any interaction with anyone else, it might be the deputy that's there. You said there was one there, I mean, just manning the, the clinic? That's on a constant watch. Or just in the clinic. Is there, is there a, a deputy that stays there at all times, like at the desk, or? He is assessed, or he is seen every 15 minutes on clock rounds from deputies. Okay. But generally speaking, how many remain there at any given time? If he wanted to talk to somebody, would there, you know, and you were not available or it wasn't your day or he didn't need to technically see you, would there be somebody, a deputy at the desk there or something that he could ask for something? He would have to wait until somebody comes through comes. or one of the medical staff. There's not somebody sitting outside. He's not on a constant watch, right. so there's not somebody. But I didn't, in proximity, there's, is there usually a deputy that mans the clinic or is? Yes. Okay. So there's that, and then just the medical staff that are there? Yes. Do you know how many people are part of the medical staff? I do And you may not know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McKelvey. Rebuttal? Just very briefly, Your Honor. You testified that you are you were the individual responsible for taking the defendant off a suicide watch. Is that correct? That is correct. What factors went into making that determination? I cannot give in, I can't provide you with that information because that's privileged information. What factors, you've had other individuals, other inmates on suicide watch, correct? That is correct. And in a, in a general sense, what factors do you consider when making that determination to take them off a of suicide watch? And again, I can't provide you with that information because it is privileged. How long was the defendant on suicide watch? That I am unsure of. And in regards to his education, have you provided the defendant with any um, books, like reading material? Yes, I have. And what books have those been? Harry Potter, mostly. Okay. And to the best of your knowledge, has he read those books? To my knowledge, yes. And if the defendant needed to speak with someone, um, how needed to speak with you specifically? Would he be able to contact you? In other words, if it, I believe your testimony earlier, was that um, you generally meet with him on Mondays, but say it's a Wednesday. How would he contact you or how would he be able to reach you if he needed to see you? He tells a deputy and the deputy either calls me and if it's after hours, he leave a message and I see him the following day. And is that for all inmates or specifically for this defendant? That is for all inmates if it, if it sees fit the situation, but because the defendant is a juvenile, I would make an exception to put him at the top of the list. 
And you've been to the defendant's cell, correct? Where yes. you meet him? Are you familiar with a button inside of his cell? A button that allows him to con to reach I've never been inside the cell. I don't know what what like where the buttons are. I've stepped in the doorway, but I don't know where there's Do a button. Do you meet with him inside the clinic, correct? Yes. And you meet with him in the doorway of his cell, correct? Yes. Okay. And it's your testimony you've never seen a button? I'm not familiar with a button is what I'm saying is I've okay. never paid that close attention. My, my focus is on the person I'm working with, not on a button. Are you aware, um, have you been in other cells inside of the clinic? Yes. And have you seen a button inside of the other cells that are inside of the clinic? I can't say I've ever noticed any buttons because I've never paid that close attention. When I'm dealing with somebody in the clinic, it's usually a crisis situation and I'm focused on that person. One moment. Spelling. Again, I'm not asking for any specific factors regarding this defendant, but I am again going to ask, what factors do you generally consider or look at when making a determination that an individual should be taken off a suicide watch? And for me, answering that verifies information that I am unable to provide you. So, I mean, if we need a recess, so I can. One, one moment, I'll interject here. So, I believe the question in general are you considering a person's age? Are you considering their education? Are you considering uh, their psychological history at that point? In general, not anything specific about this defendant or any individual that you may be uh, evaluating, but in general, when you're considering whether or not to take the person off of suicide watch, what are you looking at? Are you looking at their age? Are you looking at their maturity at the time? What are you looking at? But I don't know, want to know the specifics about Mr. Crumbly. Um, just in general, what factors are you looking at? And again, it takes, I am not, okay. I am not the only one when making this decision, I, collaborate with other people in making this decision. Okay. And I'm trying to be protective of information. So I'm not alone in making this decision, if that makes sense to you. That makes sense, Mrs. Bell. Let me ask you this. Would you take an individual off a suicide watch if you had concerns about their safety? No. When you took the defendant off a suicide watch. Is it fair to say you didn't have any concerns about his safety at that time? Correct. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Washington. I did have a couple of follow-up questions. I understand that he's not on a constant watch or suicide watch right now. What type of watch is he on, if any? He's currently on a behavior watch. Can you tell me what that means? He is on a behavior watch as told that he would stay on by my command staff, that he would not come off of it. So I, it's, it's a, if anybody is on a behavior watch, I automatically meet with them one time a week. And anything over that is just me catching up with people. Now when you say behavioral watch, is, uh, can you describe to me what that means in general? What is a behavioral watch? And why would an individual be placed on a behavioral watch? Uh, behavior watch is usually a step down from being on a suicide watch. After they are cleared from being on suicide watch, they step down into a behavior watch and we just further assess for any kind of behavioral changes at that time. Okay, so you're continuing, as you mentioned earlier, to meet with him two times per week to assess continued behavior issues or lack thereof? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. there any follow-up questions based upon my questions from the people? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Anything further, Ms. Lofton, based upon my questions? I do have a question. Um, Ma'am, in your meetings with Mr. Crumbly, would you agree with me they're less than five minutes? No, sometimes we meet longer. Okay. 
And again, the meetings occur while you stand at his door, correct? That is correct. No further questions. Okay, thank you. Anything else from this witness? Nothing from the people, Your Honor. Nothing from defense, thank you. Thank you, may this witness be excused? Yes, Your Honor, no objection. Thank you, ma'am, you are all set, you are excused. Please don't talk about your testimony with anyone outside, okay? People, you may call your next witness. Your Honor, the people next call Heather Calcaterra to the stand. Okay, thank you. My staff will retrieve her. Could you spell the last name for me, please? Certainly. C-A-L-C-A-T, as in Tom, E-R-R-A. Thank you. Penalty of perjury? I do. Thank you. Ma'am, you may have a seat, and if you are comfortable, you are more than welcome to remove your mask. Thank you. You are very welcome. And people, your witness? Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Could I please have you state your full name and spell your last name for the record? Heather Calcaterra, C A L C A T E R R A. Wanted to make sure I spelled it correctly for the court. Um, could you tell me where you are employed? Oakland County Children's Village. And in what capacity? What's your job title? I am the manager. Okay. And how long have you been with Children's Village? Uh, since 2013. Okay. And did you start off as a manager or did you work to that, uh, that position? I started as an administrator. Okay. And as a manager, what are your duties there at Children's Village? Um, generally, I, I oversee the day-to-day -day operations of the campus. Okay. So you're familiar with the campus and its individual buildings? Yes. Could you just give us a, a, an explanation of what is Children's Village, what it consists of, what it looks like, that kind of thing? Uh, Children's Village is Oakland County's child caring campus for youth. Uh, we have three um, separate licenses. Uh, one of them is for secure detention, one of them is for residential treatment, both secure and non-secure, and one of them is for shelter care services. And you've mentioned a campus, so are all of these separate programs, I'll call them, hopefully I'm calling them the right word, but are all of these separate programs within the same general vicinity? Um, the buildings are not all connected, but there are multiple buildings on a large campus. And are any of the buildings connected to each other? Uh, our secure treatment program is connected by a hallway to our detention center. Okay, and what is the difference between a secure placement program versus the detention center? Um, the youth in our secure treatment program are there for treatment. So it's a residential treatment program, meaning they will live there um, until they finish um, accomplishing various treatment goals. Detention um, is where youth stay when they are detained, awaiting court action or placement. So if I understand you correctly, a secure treatment portion of the facility is for those who have already been I'll use the word sentenced, or those who have already been sentenced to serve in that treatment program. Correct. Would a person who is simply being held at Children's Village prior to uh, a trial, let's say, would they ever be a participant in the secure treatment area of the building? Um, only if the court ordered that action. Okay. And when you talk about secure treatment, what types of treatment programs are you talking about? 
Um, our young people in treatment uh, participate in uh, family therapy, group therapy. Uh, we use an evidence-based journaling system. Okay. So let's talk about the secure detention area um, and what that consists of. Who is housed at the detention, the secure detention area? Um, young people who are detained awaiting court action. How many people does it hold? 60 is our capacity. Okay. I'm sorry, was that one six or six zero? Six zero. Thank you. And what are the age ranges of those individuals who are or can be in secure detention? Typically 11 to 17. Okay. Can it be older? Yes. Can it be younger? Yes. Okay. Um, the other areas of the campus, fair to say that those areas can, and specifically the shelter care, Children even younger than 10, 9, 8, can they be housed in the shelter area? Shelter care is birth to 17. Okay. What types of individuals can be housed in the secure detention facility? Um, when I say what types of individuals, I guess that was a poor question. Uh, presumably, and correct me if I'm wrong, those people in secure detention have been accused of committing a crime. Correct. What types of crimes uh, are, I guess, encompassed in that secure detention facility? All crimes. Um, it could be anything from a, a drug offense to joyriding to retail fraud to assault, um, all, all crimes. Okay, so fair to say it could be something that is absolutely nonviolent and is purely, I'll say delinquent, up to the most violent crime? Correct. Okay. <coughs> How many do you currently have in secure detention, if you know? Uh, 38. Okay. How many do you currently have housed in the Children's Village Secure Detention that are there on a charge of murder? None. Okay. We've talked a little bit with someone else about residents of the jail. Um, do I call somebody who's at Children's Village a resident of Children's Village? Yes, we, we call them residents. Okay. So can you describe to me sort of, and without... Well, can you describe to me the setup of the secure detention area? What it looks like and what a typical day looks like for someone who's in secure detention. So secure detention is one large building um, and it is divided into three uh, kind of separate units, we call them. So there are two units for males and there is one unit for females. Um, we do try to separate the males based on age or cognitive deficits, certainly try to separate co-defendants to the best of our ability. Um, but there's only two units, so sometimes we have to you know, we have to do the best that we can. Um, in terms of a typical day, um, our young people wake up around 7 a.m. Um, they typically do kind of a quick cleanup of, of their room, um, a quick hygiene, uh, breakfast, and then they attend school. Um, after school, um, they would have some recreation, um, they would have some kind of homework time, quiet time, um, they would have dinner, um, and you know, maybe some more kind of quiet time or recreation, and then they would begin hygiene to, to prepare for, for bedtime or bed prep. Okay. You mentioned units. Are, are those separate units, in essence, separate hallways? Uh, yes, each unit has, has a separate hallway, yes. Okay, and is it fair to say that they all converge into one main school area? When you come out of your unit or your hallway, you come into the hallways of the school. Yes, we have one main school hall. Okay. So you mentioned a, a typical day. So let me ask you about the residents and their individual quarters, I'll call them. Okay. They have their own rooms? Yes. So they don't have a bunk mate, right? No. They have their own individual room? Correct. Um, does that room have a door? Yes. Does it have a window in the door? Uh, I believe all rooms, yes, have a window, yes. Okay. Does it have a, a glass wall, though? No. Okay, it's just a window in the door. Yes. Do, does the room have a, a, any, I guess, I mean, do I have a dresser in there? Do I have, you know, a toilet in there? What do I have in that room? <laughs> Most rooms consist of uh, just a cement slab with a mattress that is brought in during um, sleeping hours. We do have some rooms that have toilets built in. Um, if a young person were to have to stay in their room, then, then we would try to put them in that type of a room. That's kind of an observation room as well. Okay. Now you mentioned uh, typically what time are they in their individual rooms on any um, given day? Give or take probably about 8.30 p.m. until 7 a.m. Okay. 
otherwise, if I understood you correctly, they spend their time in classrooms. Correct. Um, in uh, having meals. Is that in a cafeteria type location? Yes, yes, we have a cafeteria. You mentioned rec time. I'm assuming that's like recreation time. Yes. Under different weather circumstances, do they go outside? Yes, we have a secure fenced in courtyard. Okay. Um, we also have two gymnasiums okay. indoors. And do you have a, a, a meeting room or a day room, if you will? Yes, uh, a day room uh, where the kids would assemble to maybe play board games, cards, um, watch television. Okay. Now, the secure detention specifically, well, well, I guess let me ask you, Children's Village in general, is it meant to be a permanent location or is it meant to be temporary? Temporary. Okay. People in secure detention, do I understand correctly that those persons are usually individuals who are awaiting some type of more permanent placement, whether it's to go home or to go into the treatment uh, area of the building? That is correct. Okay. I might go back to some of those issues, but let me ask you about staffing at Children's Village. So, is there a certain number of staff ratio to the residents at the facility? Um, in detention, we maintain a ratio of one staff to eight residents during waking hours. Okay. So do I understand correctly that for every one staff member, there could be up to eight people uh, that that individual is monitoring? Correct. Um, are the staff members assigned based on gender? Does that make sense? Like are, are male staff members the ones supervising males and female staff members are supervising female? Not exclusively, no. We do cross-gender staffing. Okay. The people that these residents come into contact with mostly, what is their job title called? Um, youth specialist youth would special. have the most contact with our residents. What does a youth specialist do? A youth specialist um, is with the kids uh, or the residents all the time. Um, they are responsible for maintaining the ratio, which is the one to eight, um, supervising them when they're in school, um, when they are eating, when they are doing hygiene, essentially, all the time. Um, okay. Um, and they're with them, but they're with those eight. Correct. Okay. So how about in the cafeteria? Am I only watching those eight or what am I doing if I'm a youth specialist in the cafeteria? Um, there would be, depending on how many young people are in the cafeteria, there could be more than one youth specialist. Um, and so they would position themselves accordingly. One would kind of be kind of you know, walking around the room to maintain safety. One may be positioned kind of near the kitchen area while kids are taking their plates. Um, it would depend how many kids are in that room. Okay. Do you still maintain that one to eight ratio in the cafeteria? Yes, um, but it could, depending on how many youth are eating, we could do two to 16, for example. It would just depend. Okay. Um, and do you maintain that one to eight ratio in the day room or out in the gym or yes. outside in the yard? Yes. Okay. So let me ask you this, are, are those youth specialists meant to monitor the behaviors or are they meant to monitor the conversations, what their in, information they're exchanging, you know, ideas they may have? Um, we monitor the behaviors. Um, we would do our best to monitor conversations, um, but we would likely not hear all the conversations, every word that a young person says to one another, uh, because they are allowed to talk. Um, and so if I'm responsible for aid, I may not hear everything that is discussed. Okay. And that is true whether they're in the classroom or the cafeteria area, the day room, or any of those rec sites? Yes. Okay. Are there arrangements made you're familiar with the defendant at issue in this case, correct? Correct. At least somewhat familiar. You, you know who we're here about and what he's accused of doing, correct? Yes. Um, in a situation like that, would he be 
housed in a different area? Would he be secluded from uh, his peers and other uh, individuals who may be younger than him or older? I believe he would be in the same group with his peers. What qualifications uh, does a youth specialist have to have before they become a youth specialist? Um, you have to be 21 years of age. You have to have either a high school diploma or a GED and um, no felonies. Okay. And, and you said that the youth specialists are the ones that are with the, the residents most often. Correct. What about behavioral issues? So if I'm monitoring eight individuals and one gets out of hand, what happens to the other seven while I'm trying to monitor the one that is out of hand? Um, the youth specialist would call for supervisor assistance, uh, or maybe what we refer to as a code two, okay. which is, again, assistance. Okay, and where is that assistance coming from? Um, other supervisors on campus would come to that area where, where assistance was needed. Fair to say that they might not necessarily be in close proximity to where assistance is needed yes. at that time. Yes. Okay, could take some time. It could. Is anybody in Children's Village uh, required to have any law enforcement training? No. Is anybody at Children's Village, specifically in secure detention, armed? No. At any time? No. Do youth specialists receive any type of behavior management training? Yes. And is that in-house? Uh, yes, we okay. do our own training. Okay. Um, am I correct in believing that the training focuses on non-physical management techniques? Um, we are trained in physical management, but it is to be used as a last resort. Have there been situations where at Children's Village, and, and I'm talking now about secure detention, um, where something has happened that is beyond the capability of the employees at Children's Village? Um, meaning we needed to call law enforcement? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, and when you, when you have to call law enforcement, Children's Village campus is on the Oakland County campus, correct? Correct. So the assistance that you seek is law enforcement from the Oakland County Sheriff's Office? Yes. Are those the same individuals that are employed at the Oakland County Jail? Uh, I believe so. Okay. Now in addition to the youth specialists, are there other persons who are employed at the secure detention facility at Children's Village? Yes. And what positions do they hold? Do you have? Um, we have case coordinators uh, okay. who are essentially case managers. Um, we have clinicians um, who are licensed uh, professionals either within social work, psychology, or counseling. Um, we have supervisors um, and we have teachers provided to us through the Waterford um, you know, School District. Okay. So the case coordinators, do I understand correctly? Case coordinators are the ones who manage the cases. They'll, they'll meet with the resident, they will create court reports, they will uh, update the court on progress or uh, lack of progress, things of that nature? Yes. Okay. Um, clinicians, you said that there are licensed clinicians. Do you have a psychiatrist on staff? Um, we have a relationship with a consulting psychiatrist. Okay, and what does that mean? That that person will come in when called or does that person come in on a regular basis? Uh, he is scheduled to come on campus two days per week. Okay. Partial days. And that consulting psychiatrist, you mentioned it's a he, so um, does he come and meet with the resident individually or do they meet over, over a telemed or what is the uh, situation? He, he comes on per, on per, in person, I'm sorry, okay. and uh, he does medication management uh, okay. for our young people. 
So is the psychiatrist called in only if the person is uh, in need of medication, um, not a medica medical regime? Generally, regime? yes. Okay. Do you have other clinicians who are on staff? Other than in detention? In or secure detention? Yes, we have our own clinicians. Okay, how many? Um, in detention, um, there is one. Okay. And does that, in, what is the background of that person? Does that person, is, are they licensed in counseling? Are they a psychologist? What, what? She is licensed. I believe she's a professional counselor. Okay. You know, in speaking with you prior to the hearing, um, you also are a professional counselor, correct? Correct. Are you licensed? I am. So let me ask you this. Um, the clinician that you have on staff and yourself, are you, do you possess a degree or certificate that is specialized or uh, that is specialized toward juvenile clients? I do not. Okay. I do not believe she does either. Does every resident see that clinician on a regular basis? No. What's the criteria for that clinician to see a particular resident? Uh, in detention, the clinician provides crisis intervention um, and medication management. Okay. So when you say crisis intervention, what, what does that mean? What does that look like? Um, it could look like a young person who may be suicidal, um, experiencing a high level of anxiety, um, maybe a state of kind of hyperarousal, um, depression, um, maybe struggling with some issue. And who determines whether a particular resident is symptomatic of any of those things? Um, we have weekly staff meetings uh, where uh, we talk about the young people. Um, you know, the, the individuals assigned to detention will meet and discuss the behaviors on the floor, the issues. Um, they can be referred by any staff member um, in terms of a level of need. So am I correct in surmising that if someone wasn't outwardly expressing anxiety, concerns, you know, or manifesting in some tangible way, that may go undetected by staff members even in the group assessments and the group discussions? Potentially. I'd like to talk to you about staffing and staffing issues, if any, during the pandemic and beyond. Are you currently experiencing any staffing issues with regard to the numbers mm -hmm. and the number of shifts, things like that? Uh, yes. Okay. You have vacancies right now? We do. Okay. And are those vacancies, are we talking about youth specialists? Uh, yes, some are youth specialists. Okay. What other areas of the secure detention where are you? experiencing some staffing issues. We have two clinician vacancies, not specific to detention, but, but campus-wide. Okay. Have you had an occasion where staffing issues are such that you don't have enough staff to monitor even the behaviors in a one to eight ratio? Um, yes. And when that happens, where do these residents go? Um, so for the first time ever, um, about a month ago, we had to implement a temporary lockdown, not because of behavior, but because of staffing. Um, and so we did that for about a week um, on our afternoon shift uh, because we simply could not staff it safely. And so our only option was to do that. So when you say that you went into that, what did you call it? A kind of a lockdown. lockdown. So when you went into that lockdown, Am I understanding correctly that each resident would go to their solitary cell or room and they would stay there for the remainder of the day and night? Yes. Any interaction with anybody? Um, staff would do 15 minute checks up and down the hallway. Okay. But other than that, no. And how does one resident, if they need to, beckon a staff member if they are within that 15 minutes? Um, they would knock on the door or yell. 
when a resident is in their room, what is contained in the room? Do they have access to books in their room? Typically, um, two books or you know two items, reading material type items, um, could be in their room. And how is that provided? Uh, we have a library on campus okay. where um, parents, guardians are able to send items, although not now because we have had no visitation due to COVID. Okay. Um, do they have? Do the residents have access when they're in their rooms to a television? They do not. How about a tablet? No. Can they watch movies? In their rooms, no. Can they play any type of video games? No. Okay. You mentioned meals um, in a cafeteria type room. So is it cafeteria style where everybody gets the same meal? Yes. Um, does Children's Village and its residents maintain what I would call a commissary account, where they have their own account with money and they can purchase items that they may want or need? No. Okay. Now let's go back and talk about the school aspect of your facility. We talked about the hallways. So if are students in one class throughout the day? I know they move to different classrooms, but they stay in the same group. So the group moves from room to room. Do I understand correctly that when they move from one room to the other, they would be with their youth specialist? Yes. During class time, where are the youth specialists that are monitoring those children? Um, there are several youth specialists in the hallway right outside each classroom. Are the classrooms divided by units or how are they divided? Yes. They're divided by units. Yes. Okay, so if I'm on this unit with all of these other males, yes. those would be my classmates. Yes. Okay. Um, in the classroom, is there one teacher? Yes. And you said that that teacher is contracted through Waterford Schools? Correct. Is there any mechanism in place with Children's Village to accommodate an individual education plan for an individual resident? An IEP for special No, education? let's say you didn't want a particular student in okay. a classroom setting um, for whatever reason. Can that student access a virtual school? Um, Waterford would have to make arrangements. Okay. Um, that would require additional resources for us because that would have to be supervised outside of our normal supervision within the classroom um, and likely maybe additional resources for Waterford. Okay. Now I know you said you contract with Waterford Public Schools. Correct. Okay. If a student has been permanently expelled from their public school are public schools, if you know, obligated to provide an education curriculum for that student? I can't comment to public schools. Um, we are because we are a, a detention facility with adjudicated youth, so we are obligated. Let me ask you this. While you are obligated, would Waterford Public Schools have the opportunity to reject placing one of their teachers in that contractual scenario? I don't know. Does Children's Village train, are you familiar with the training called ALICE training? Um, I know what it is, yes. Okay. Are there such trainings, ALICE trainings, at Children's Village? We do not provide them for our Children's Village employees. Um, the teachers receive ALICE training uh, through Waterford Schools. Okay. Um, the residents do not participate in that. Okay. And Ms. Collins, just for the record, uh, could you describe what Alice Schools is or have your witness describe what that is? Could you could you explain what Alice training is? Um, I believe it is training in case of a, an emergency in a school such as a, a shooting. Okay. Thank you. Um, the 
the classrooms themselves, I, I'm assuming, but I need you to correct me if I'm wrong, uh, does it include textbooks? Yes. So the students each have a textbook? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Um, are, are there the, the normal accoutrements in a classroom setting, pencils or pens and textbooks and things that you would need in order to conduct class and participate in class? Um, yes, with modification. So textbooks, yes. Uh, workbooks, yes. Um, pencils are checked out and then checked back in so we can keep an inventory. The metal is removed from the top of pencils. Um, we don't use, for example, regular staplers. They are stapleless staplers, so they kind of put a crease in the paper. Um, but as far as posters on walls and, and you know it, things like that, that it, they appear to be like regular classrooms, yes. Okay, and, and, I, and I'm, I'm not trying to be sarcastic or smart, but pencils are still sharp, correct? They could, with or without the metal, they can be used as weapons if one was so inclined. Would correct. you agree with that? Correct. The st staple less staplers, <laughs> if yeah. I said that right, <laughs> right, they still have some heft to them, correct? I mean, they're an object that could be used as a weapon if one were so inclined. Yes. And these are all objects that in those ALICE trainings, under normal circumstances, we would tell students to utilize as weapons if, if it was necessary, right? Uh, I think so. Okay. With regard to the recreation time, are residents required to participate? Um, we cannot force residents to participate in rec. So are they required to go to yes. the rec site? Yes, they, they have to maintain their ratio with their staff. Okay. So during this recreation time, if, if I'm in the gym and there's basketballs available to me and there's you know some residents that are you know shooting baskets, um, but I could also be off in another area of the gym just having a conversation. Is that fair? Um, yes, it's kind okay. of sitting off to the side. Okay. Let's talk about communications when a resident is at Children's Village. Um, what does a resident have available to them in order to communicate with those who are not in secure detention? So we use um, the same payphone type system as used in the jail where families put money onto the account. Um, residents have an approved call list um, that is um, either established by, you know, a parent guardian would request, but then of course the court has to approve. Um, if there's any restrictions, then we would honor that. Um, but they make calls on those phones. Um, they also make calls uh, with their case coordinator in an office, again, based on approvals and restrictions. Um, and then residents are allowed to send and receive mail, um, again, also based on an approved list. Okay. And that approved list is generally, what does it take to be approved to be a person that can communicate with the resident? Um, so a parent guardian can make a request. Okay. Um, we would defer to the court and make sure there are no legal restrictions. Um, for example, we don't allow them to write to victims, can't write to co-defendants. Um, Typically, mail to and from correctional facilities is not allowed unless it's a parent or a guardian, um, but it also has to be approved by the court in those types of situations. Um, okay. No letters to and from girlfriends, things like that. Okay. So, mental health services. We talked about some of the clinicians that you have one on staff and then you've contracted with a psychiatrist. Um, fair to say that unless there were a request by the resident or some outward revelation that the resident was struggling, um, the psychological or mental health services would not be ongoing. It's not like they meet with them once a week, or does he engage in group therapy or individual therapy, anything like that? There is no group therapy. Okay. Um, we do, every, everything you said is correct. Um, we do also do a screening and admission just to assess a young person's kind of state of mind as they're coming in. Um, so if they were identified to have any of those issues I mentioned earlier, your suicide or depression or anxiety, um, we may put them on a safety plan and they would be monitored, but it, that is not an ongoing um, necessarily therapeutic relationship, it is not treatment, it is still crisis intervention. Okay.
if I could just interject a question. With this safety plan, you said it's crisis intervention. Um, are the residents <coughs> still allowed to come and go as they please, uh, pretty much? So would they still be in the cafeteria, still be in their room um, on an individual basis and just watched a little more? Um, yes, um, but the safety plan could build in other um, kind of precautions. So it could, for example, say something like no sharps, which would mean that young person wouldn't have access to pencils. It could say that young person has to be within arm's length of, an, of a staff member. Um, so they would maybe be at the front or the back of the line, depending on where the staff member is positioned. But they would still uh, very likely be in a group setting. Thank you. Could the situation ever arise where, where one staff member who is monitoring the eight has multiple who have a special plan like that? Uh, yes. Okay. You mentioned the lockdown situation that occurred, in, if I understood you correctly, you said it, was, it lasted approximately a week? Yes. Um, is it a fair statement that at this point you still can't predict whether that would happen again? Yes. Okay. With regard to communications, one avenue of communication that I didn't ask you about was email. Are residents uh, able to either receive or send email no. correspondence? No. Not at all? No. Okay. You're familiar, are you not, with why we're here today and the request that's being made? Yes. Have you contemplated any concerns that you have on behalf of Children's Village? were that change to be made? Yes. And what are those concerns? Um, I think first and foremost, safety and security for everyone. Um, I think uh, resources in terms of staffing and mental health. Um, we don't know what we don't know in terms of um, this particular case, and we've never had a situation like this involving a school shooting or a defendant uh, who was um, going to you know, use the insanity plea. Um, so we don't know what we're going to need. I have concerns about the trauma impact on other young people. Um. Do you have any concerns about, well, let me ask you about the trauma impact that you're referencing. You have concerns about the trauma impact on other residents. Yes. What do you mean by trauma impact? Um, again, we've never had a case like this at Children's Village. I've never had a case like this in my career. Um, this was a a devastating situation and um, we don't know what the defendant's presence on our campus in the classrooms on the units what that presence how that may trigger or impact other young people um, from Oakland County does that go hand in hand with any concerns that you might have both for the safety of other residents as well as the safety of this particular defendant correct um, I would also be concerned about his safety um, I do not know if he would be a target um, I do not know if his presence in a juvenile facility would cause him to experience any type of trauma. And is there any contemplation of, and I'll call it mental isolation, that's probably not a scientific phrase, but mental isolation differenti differentiating himself from the other residents there. You, you mentioned that there's parent involvement and when COVID is not in place, there's visitations and things like that. Um, have you contemplated or thought about that and its effect on this particular defendant? Um, I, I have, and it certainly could have an impact. Um, we are scheduled to resume visitation, in-person visitation um, on March 1st um, in all of our programs. And so where other young people may be receiving frequent contact, um, I do not believe this defendant will. And that could have an impact on him, yes. Okay. If I may have one moment, Your Honor. Sure. Your Honor, I have no further questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Calvatera. Ms. Lofton? Yes, thank you. Hello, ma'am. Hi. If I ask you something that you don't understand, just let me know and I'll try to ask it a different way, okay? okay sure. Already. Um, you describe Children's Village as a secure detention facility, is that correct? Um, Children's Village is the county's child care and campus for youth. We do have a secure detention area. Okay. And it's called a secure detention 
uh, area because it is considered secure, correct? Correct. When Mr. Crumbly was actually at Children's Village, uh, did you have any interaction with him? I did not. Do you know how long he was actually in your facility? Um, less than 24 hours. And during those 24 hours, he was placed in either a suicide watch or a constant watch lockdown uh, situation. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. There was no problems with Mr. Crumbly during those 24 or less hours, correct? None that I'm aware of. And you stated uh, that you have residents with varying um, charges. So they can be misdemeanors all the way to felonies and life offenses. Is that correct? Um, not life, well, life defense, I, I guess describe life offenses. Armed robbery, uh, yes. murder. Correct. I know that you have stated that there is no one currently housed uh, with the charge of murder. But you would agree with me in the past, um, in the recent past, there have been individuals housed there charged with murder, correct? Yes, correct. And there have been situations where you have housed a juvenile um, until they reach the age uh, that they can be transferred to the Oakland County Jail and then they're transferred to the Oakland County Jail. Correct. And you stated that the um, housing itself or the rooms or the the bedrooms of the individuals, um, they all have their own cell or, or bedroom, is that correct? Yes. Okay. And you stated that these individuals are in their cell from approximately 8.30 p.m. to 7 a.m., is that correct? Yes. And you stated that your max capacity is 60 people uh, and currently you're at 38, correct? Yes. Now this may seem like a silly question, but um, the inmates, uh, or the residents I should say, when they are brought to your facility, they're pat down, correct? Yes. Okay. And um, do they stay in civilian clothes or do you have them in specific outfits uh, for Children's Village? Uh, no, they have to put all their personal belongings into storage and they wear um, kind of a, a, a jumpsuit type item. Okay. So they would not have access to guns or knives, correct? Correct. And you actually stated um, that if the individuals that are assessing the resident feel that that person um, needs some sort of crisis intervention, there's something called a safety plan that can even go one step further um, in securing the safety of not only that resident, but the other students, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and that safety plan can include no access to pencils or anything sharp, is that correct? Yes and to always be very close to a staff member within those the arms are, Yes, those are examples, yes. Okay. Is that something that is done frequently? Are there a number of individuals there on safety plans or? I would say it varies. It's not unusual. Now, you described um, clinicians, therapists, um, that come in and out, in, and even a psychiatrist. So if someone is flagged or is thought to have anxiety, depression, how often um, or how many times per week are they interacting with uh, either the psychiatrist or some sort of clinician dealing with that specific issue? That would be determined by the clinician, um, depending on their initial assessment of the young person. Okay. Can that happen one time per week? Can it, can it happen it more could. than one time per week? It could, both, yes. Okay. And the psychiatrist that um, is contracted there, that is there two days per week, is that individual able to um, prescribe medication? Yes. I want to talk a little bit about the educational program. Um, is that program through Waterford Schools a program that actually leads the individual to a GED or a diploma? It could lead to a diploma, yes. We do not provide GED instruction. And as you stated, you are obligated to provide education uh, through your facility, correct? Yes.
I want to talk about the physical activity. Um, how often, and I know it may have been a little bit different during COVID, but how often do your residents uh, enjoy some sort of recreation time? Um, daily. And how long is that? Um, minimum of an hour. It's not all physical though. Um, it can be physical, it can be reading, it can be television, um, board games. Do they have a gym class through the Waterford school system or no? Yes. Okay. And how often do the residents um, participate in that gym class? You know what, I would have to check the schedule. I'm not sure. I'm Understood. sorry. No problem. And you would agree with me, the communication that your residents have with the outside world is pretty limited, right? Correct. Okay, so the phone system, they're only able to call out, correct? Not receive calls in? Um, yes, they call out on the, the pay phones. Okay, and that's an approved list. It's not just to anybody? Yes. Okay, and you stated the letters. Um, now, if they were to receive a letter from a stranger uh, or someone that's not on the list, would that letter then be returned? Yes. Now I want to talk a little bit about um, what happens when one of your residents has some type of bad behavior. Is there, I know that they each have their own individual room, um, is there some type of solitary confinement or isolation other than returning them to their room? So we are right now able to use seclusion only as a last resort um, for the minimum amount of time needed um, to help a young person regain uh, control of their behaviors. Um, only in cases where a young person is a danger to themselves or others. Um, however, we are a licensed child caring institution and our rules, the rules that we must follow are, are changing literally as we speak. Um, and as of May 1st, seclusion is prohibited in child caring institutions. So that will not be something we can do um, as of May 1st. Now, um, you were asked some questions about your thoughts about having Mr. Crumbly um, placed there. Um, you obviously have had residents that have been there multiple times, correct? Correct. <coughs> okay. And that have behavioral issues? Correct. Okay. And charged with assaultive crimes or very serious crimes? Yes. I have no further questions, but Ms. Hopp may have a few for you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hopp. Thank you. I want to address specifically the education aspect of your uh, facility. Um, and you said you were a detention facility obligated to provide education. What do you mean by that? Um, all of our young people must be enrolled in school within five days. Um, those are licensing rules for child caring institutions. And it's also the law, correct? That if a person is under the age of 18 and in a facility, they have to be provided education. I believe so, yes. And so you contract with Waterford, correct? Yes. You mentioned classrooms. Are there live teachers that come? Yes. And what subjects do they teach? Um, the core <coughs> curriculum, so math, um, science, uh, reading. I would have to look at the exact schedule to know the names, but all the core subjects. And that would be for all grades, correct? Yes. Um, and I believe Ms. Lofton touched on it, but you mentioned that the goal was, or I guess the goal was for a high school diploma as opposed to a GED. Yes, uh, well our young people earn credits, um, so it is possible to actually graduate from school from Children's Village. More common is that they would earn the credits so that they would graduate when they leave Children's Village. Now credits, those are high school credits usually? Uh, I believe so, yes. And that would be to a specific school district? I'm not an educational provider, so I don't, I don't know the answer to that. So, for example, if Waterford is providing the education program, then that student would get credit in the Waterford School District for the 
classes, correct? Yes, I believe so. So they would have tests and they would be graded, correct? Yes. yes. Now you mentioned homework. Yes. What types of homework would that be? Um, whatever the teachers assign in each class. So they would have perhaps writing assignments or Potentially, math yes. worksheets to do or geography, government pro projects to do or something like that? Potentially, yes. And they have the opportunity to do that homework there at the facility after school? Yes. What time does the school begin? Um, I'd say 8.05, give or take. I'm sorry, I don't know the exact time. Give or take, what time does it end? Uh, 3.15. So the day between school, rec, homework time is very structured for these individuals yes. in your care, correct? Yes. And that's for all of them, correct? Yes. Now, um, once a juvenile leaves your facility to go to, for example, the jail, are you obligated to continue providing education services? I don't believe so. Um, to your knowledge, would the jail then take over that responsibility? I don't know. Now, um, have you provided any educational services to the jail or not you personally arranged for that to be done for juveniles housed in the Oakland County Jail? Not that I'm aware of. And um, do you provide any oversight for the education programs for juveniles that are housed in the jail? No. To your knowledge, do any of the teachers from the Waterford program that come to your facility, do they also go to the jail to do any sort of classroom instruction there? I don't believe so, but I, I don't know. No other questions, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hoff. Ms. McKelvey, did you have any questions? I do, thank you. Good afternoon, Ms. Um, Calcaterra. Um, just a couple of clarifications. I'm curious when you talk about you listed the um, programs of the day or how a day is conducted. What's hygiene? What does that constitute? Um, in the morning, it's kind of brushing teeth, washing your face, kind of getting yourself ready for the school day. In the evening, it, it's a more thorough hygiene. So in terms of shower and you know, and grooming. who provides the soap and the towels and all the necessary things, the toothbrush, the toothpaste. So Children's Village provides that. Correct, they, yes. Parents or guardians, nobody has to provide that. The, the Children's Village provides all that for yes. them, along with the, with the jumpsuit or however you want to describe yes. what they wear. Yes. Now, just, just um, you talked about that uh, you can't make... Um, anyone participate in rec but the individual goes with the group obviously just based upon where uh, 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 how you've described it the youth specialist would have to at least have that individual if they're sitting out be in close proximity to them to keep tabs on them while they're also watching those that are participating in rec it's not like they can go sit you know somewhere on a bleacher or whatever and have a chat that that youth specialist still has to keep tabs of that individual. Um, we call it line of sight and so you have to maintain line of sight of, of your young person your group great now when you talk about contact uh, uh, with with family or so forth uh, as a concern uh, potentially um, he's allowed to have visits with his attorneys correct and yes. phone calls and so uh, that element is not precluded from Correct. him even if that is the only you know contact that he has yes you're right but he is not able to have a have the outside contact from from emails or anything of that nature or any strangers that may send things correct so it, one of the issues when the prosecutor talked about the commissary aspect there's really no need to have money at children's village because children's village pays for the food Yes. Pays for the clothing. Yes. Pays for the soap and the towels. And so none of them have any kind of access to, to money over there, correct? Correct. What, how, and the phone calls are through a system like the jail has? 
uh, family members put money on the phones. Okay. Um, during COVID, we uh, provided some support to families that couldn't afford it for obvious reasons. Okay. Now, when they use the, because um, I do juvenile work, so I've been to the village, I know in emergencies or sometimes the staff lets them use the desk phone. Mm -hmm. Does that cost anything or is it that? It does not. Okay. And that's usually just in an emergency situation, correct? Yes. Thank you. I don't have anything additional. Thank you. Any rebuttal? Just briefly, Your Honor. Understanding we've talked about safety plans and things that you've had experience with yes. um, in the past. Um, you can require a particular resident to take out a pencil, but then the other residents nearby still have pencils, correct? Correct. Um, when you uh, try to keep them close to their youth specialist, the kitchen still has knives, correct? The kitchen uh, still has pots and pans? Pots and pans, yes, no sharp knives. No. Okay. Um, and all of the same items that are still in Children's Village remain in Children's Village? Yes. Okay. Um, did I hear you correctly that recreation time is a one hour minimum? Minimum, yes. Sometimes more, sometimes less? Yes. Okay. Um, communications typically don't venture out to strangers. It's limited to, I'll call it his captive audience, that's residents with him. Yes, it would be his group. Okay. Are there any repercussions for the resident if they don't participate in school. They don't commit, uh, complete assignments, they don't do their homework, they don't participate in class, things like that. Um, it would be reflected in their grades. Okay. Um, and it would be reported to the court. Okay. Um, and then I, I know the school could take some action if they chose. Um, okay. When you say the school could take some action, action similar to what they could take if the student was not in secure detention? Yes, uh, okay. so school slips, um, contacting parent guardian, things of that nature. Okay. I know you were asked if there's ever been a time where other people accused of murder have been housed at Children's Village. Um, and you said there have been yes. in the past. Have any of them ever been accused of committing a murder in school? No, not to my knowledge. Have any of those prior residents at Children's Village accused of murder ever been accused of murdering their classmates in school? No. Not to my knowledge. Um, any mass shooters? No. I have no further questions. Thank you. I did have a question. You said that the secure facility has about 38 residents. Is that correct? Yes. Are you understaffed in the secure facility as well, causing troubles with the 8 to 1 ratio? Um, our staff kind of uh, can be assigned across the campus. So if there's a shortage, it, it, it impacts all of us. Okay. the whole campus. Thank you, ma'am. Any questions based on my question? No, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Any further questions of this witness? None from the people, Your Honor. I have none. Thank you. May this witness be excused? Yes, no objection. Thank you, ma'am. You are all thank set for today. Much. You are excused. Please don't talk about your, te talk about your testimony with anyone. Thank you. Thank you. People, you may call your next witness. Your Honor, the people call Captain Tom Vida. Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give will be the whole truth and not the truth of truth under penalty of perjury? I do. Thank you. Sir, you may be seated, and when you're comfortable, you may remove your mask if you wish. Thank you, sir. You're very welcome. Good afternoon, Captain Vida. Please state your full name and spell your last name for the record. Thomas Vida, V-I-D-A. And where are you currently employed? 
I'm a captain with the Oakland County Sheriff's Office. And how long have you been employed with the Oakland County Sheriff's Department? Um, 22 plus years. And how long have you been the captain? Um, it'll be a year next month, actually. <coughs> and can you describe for the court briefly what are your job responsibilities and duties as captain? Um, yes. Um, I in summary, I I'm responsible for the day-to-day -day operation of the Oakland County Jail including the supervision of employees. Now prior to becoming captain, what was your rank or title at the Sheriff's Department? I was an executive lieutenant, which was the, the jail administrator. And again, since you've only been in your current position for a year, can you please describe for the court what your job responsibilities were as an executive administrator? As the executive lieutenant, basically just um, overseeing so some functions of the jail with um, program services, our um, clinic, um, ensuring compliance with the Michigan Department of Corrections rules, any kind of federal guidelines. Okay. In the last year, Captain Vida, have you had any juveniles lodged in the Oakland County Jail? Yes. Approximately how many? Um, we've had probably four, three to four that, that I remember off the top of my head. Besides the defendant, do you have any other juveniles lodged in the Oakland County Jail? At this given time, yes I do, I've got one. The defendant came to your facility on December 1st, is that correct? December 1st of yes. 2021? Yes, 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 right. yes. Can you describe for the court what arrangements were made when this defendant arrived at your facility? Yes. Um, because he's a juvenile, we, we had to um, find selective housing for him. Um, we, we placed him in the jail clinic on a constant watch. Um, we initiated contact with our casework staff, um, with our Easter Seals personnel. Um, we had team meetings with, with our medical staff, with our um, um, program services people, um, and our, our kitchen staff to be sure that, that he's getting the, the, the proper medical treatment, the proper um, food intake. Now, I do want to address these one by one. Now, first you indicated that there was selective lodging. Is that correct? Uh, selective housing. Meaning, selective housing. Meaning because of his status, he couldn't go into a general population housing area. Okay. So where exactly is the defendant housed at? Specifically? Yes. He's in uh, J10, which is in the uh, jail clinic. In the jail clinic. And can you describe for the court um, what his... Is this a single man cell, a multi man cell? Can you describe for the court what exactly his cell looks like? His cell, his cell is a cement cell. It's got a um, glass front door with a window. It has a single bunk. It's got a half, a small half partition wall for privacy, and a toilet. Okay. And is he allowed to keep any personal effects inside of his cell? Yes. What items, if any, does he have in his personal cell? If you know. Um, he's he's purchased some commissary as of late, so he was a, he's able to have um, any kind of legal work, um, paper, pencils, um, books, anything that he that he's eligible to purchase from commissary, he's able to have. Okay. Now you indicated that um, you mentioned constant watch. Can you describe for the court what exactly do you mean when you say constant watch? Constant watch. Is, is a watch where we staff a deputy directly in front front of that inmate um, to ensure that the inmate's not um, hurting themselves. So inmates that are suicidal, highly violent, um, where, where both those criteria is where we don't have a baseline on what their behavior is, we'll, we'll assign a deputy there to make sure that that person doesn't hurt themselves until that baseline is established and they have a process in place for you know for counseling and assistance with it. And so you stated that it's a deputy that's assigned to watch the defendant. Is that correct? You're correct. <clears throat> you also stated that Easter Seals was contacted. First, can you can you explain to the court what exactly Easter Seals is and why they were contacted? East, Easter Seals is um, the, the the medical contractor that provides the the uh, um, psych psych doctors. Um, and their contact would have came through program services. Okay. 
Who made the decision to put the defendant on constant watch? Um, I believe it was going back to conversations. It, it, it was a it was a team decision, um, you know, involving myself, involving some of the hierarchy in the department to place him on an immediate watch just because of um, the circumstance surrounding why he was coming to our jail and the incident that just occurred until we were able to fully establish the baseline and determine what needs are there for him. And as we stand here today, February 22nd, is the defendant currently still on constant watch? No. Is he still being monitored? He is. And can you describe for the court what that monitoring looks like? That monitoring is what we would call a behavior watch. And <clears throat> every 15 minutes we have a deputy that will walk by his cell and ensure that he's okay. And again, these are deputies. These yeah. are not um, lay people within the jail. Correct, for, for the 15 minute watch, those are deputies, yes. Who's responsible for his supervision at the jail? Um, I, I would go back and say it's a team approach. Um, so we have program services people, um, the casework staff meets with him several times a week. You have a medical doctor who will follow up with him, a psych doctor. Then you'll have the jail clinic people that will monitor his health. You have our classification unit to be sure that he's housed where he should be housed. Then you have our line staff, our deputies that are the ones that are you know directly working the housing unit to be sure that that's you know every everything's proper. Now, I do want to go back to the inside of the defendant's cell just for a moment. If the defendant needed to make contact with someone outside of his cell, say um, a deputy or someone at the nurse station, how, if any way, would he contact them? A couple different ways. Um, there's, there's a call buzzer in there. Okay. And um, also, because in the proximity of where his cell is, the doctor's office is literally right next to it within footsteps and then the entire nursing stations are, are to the right. So he can, he can you know, knock on a window or you know, when the deputy's making their rounds, he can you know, assert something right then and there verbally. And then there's other methods that he can also notify us to. Now I do wanna pause for a moment, um, Captain Vida, and I wanna talk about what training the deputies um, in your department or at the Sheriff's Department go through. Um, in terms of being able to work inside the jail. Can you describe for that very briefly? Sure. Um, everything is um, certified through the state of Michigan, through um, the Michigan Sheriff's Training Council, and the licensing is through LCOT's local correction officers training. And our academy, totality from classroom experience to in field experience is roughly 15 weeks total. Okay. And then annually we have different um, varieties of in-service training. I think it's about 20, 20 hours we have to do. And those in-service trainings can be a variety of different things from, I don't know, crisis intervention training to you know all the way over to the other extreme of you know, use of force. So it, it just varies. Okay. And are there times where the defendant has to be moved out of his cell for one reason or another? Sure. And yes. who would be responsible for that movement? A deputy. And are your deputies armed? No, no, not in the jail or not. No. Can you describe for the court, um, and I believe you just mentioned it re regarding uh, the training, but what type of training specifically are the deputies trained in if there is an altercation in, inside the jail? Use of force. And let's talk about when does the defendant get the opportunity to leave his cell? Um, he would have the opportunity to leave his cell if he was if they were going to take him into an exam room, if they, if the nursing or medical staff needed to um, triage him or treat him medically for anything, to uh, utilize the shower, to utilize a phone. Um, when he has visits, um, 
he has to be moved to a different location for the, for the technology in order for that to occur. And if you were standing inside of the defendant's cell, is he able to see out? I know you testified earlier that there is a, a glass window. In other words, is this glass window, it's not, there isn't some type of film or anything where only on one side one person can see in. Is that, is that fair to say? That's correct. It's, it's clear. Okay. Who determines how often the caseworker sees the defendant? Um, that's usually from casework staff and usually when someone's on an active what's a suicide watch um, they'll see them daily until they can remove them from that watch and then the duration and the frequency of that is also shared with their medical provider as well the psych doctor Now, Captain Vida, you previously um, testified that the defendant, when he initially arrived, he was on uh, constant watch, is that correct? Yes. And what, if any, um, documentation or logs were the deputies required to complete during that constant watch? Um, we had, or we have, two different log sheets that are in place. We have an observation summary, which is more of a narrative version, and then we have one that's more of an abbreviated version where we, you know, write codes, abbreviated codes down for specific times and what they were doing, like if they were laying or standing or, you know. Now, are these, is, is this a free form sheet or is this a, a like a, for lack of a better term, like a, a fill in form? It's a fill in form. Okay. And, what information is captured on this form? Um, the date, the time intervals, um, and then specifically based on a legend of codes, you know, what they're doing in like laying, you would, you would write L, 15, 15 hours, 15, 30 hours, S for standing, or however the, the, the grid is. Your Honor, um, I'm showing Defense Counsel 14A, permission to approach the witness? Yes. Captain Vida, I've shown you what has been marked and previously admitted as People's Exhibit. It's actually marked as 14A. Can you identify that document? Yes. This is our <laughs> active suicide summary sheet. And again, what is the purpose of that document? It's to, it's to document description codes at specific time intervals of what someone is doing when they're on a um, suicide watch. And there are several initials on those documents, correct? Um, there's, yes, so there's two sergeants that, that conducted rounds, and uh, those are the signatures that, that are on the very top page that you presented. You also mentioned the observation sheet, is that correct? Yes. Um, as you fan through that, do you see that observation sheet that you previously mentioned? I believe it's the second or third page down? Yes. And again, um, what is the purpose of that document? This is more of a um, observation summary sheet where there's more room for specific comments, um, more so than more of an elaboration than what the uh, um, descriptive descriptive codes are. And what type of information, if any, would be required in the observation sheet? Um, it, it could be anything like he was moved to, you know, for fingerprinting. Um, had a conversation with, with deputy, um, consumed these following items, you know, for lunch or breakfast or whatever. So it, it's, just, it's just more of a um, detail than, than what the um, description codes are. And were those active suicide sheets, were those required during the constant watch? That's, that's part of our process. And are those logged somewhere within the jail? D these logs, the original logs? Yes. Yes. And do, are those logs continuing today? These logs, yes. Do I have permission to approach the witness? Yes. Captain Vida, mm -hmm. 
I'm handing you what has been marked and previously admitted as People Exhibit Number 15. Do you recognize that document? And what is that? Looks like these are copies from a log book that we utilized okay. on this constant watch. Now we've previously discussed the active suicide summary sheet. Can you describe for the public what the purpose of that log is? Purpose for this for this log was to serve two points basically. One would be for a pass on, more so um, for the deputies, so they know what is exactly what is going on. And in retrospect to where the constant watch was, as opposed to where the deputy's workstation is that has a computer, we utilized some of that, that information and in, you know, what we were able to you know, put, put the information into the IMAX system. Okay, so there, there's a lot there. So yes. first let me talk about the log. Is that log continuing? This log is not. And why is that? Because the constant watch was terminated so is it fair to say that log was only kept because of the constant watch? Yes. All right. And that log there, is that a form sheet such as the active suicide summary sheet or is that more of a freehand uh, notebook? It, it's a freehand notebook. Okay. And once that information is um, placed in that notebook, how or what method is it transferred? I think you testified to the IMAX system. Right. So. If, if there was anything that was noteworthy at that time, um, whenever a deputy had an opportunity, they would they would go to the workstation and transfer that information. Okay. And you also testified that it was basically, I think your verbiage was a pass on. Do you mean from one shift to the next? Yes, or who's ever coming in to relieve that person at that time. So deputies, they have to have a bathroom break, lunch break, and they just after a while sitting and staring at a person we need to rotate staff so so the staff member is fully aware of what's going on. Okay. Your Honor, permission to approach the witness? Yes. Captain Vida, I'm showing you what has been previously marked and admitted as people's exhibit number 16. Do you recognize that document? Yes. And what is that document? This is actually um, what we would call a event history and this is a, a printout from our um, jail management system, IMAX. Okay. And so the exhibit that we were just previously speaking with, that's the computer system um, that those notes would have been put in, is that correct? Correct, or some of them, yes, correct. Have you had an opportunity to review some of the notes in, um, listed in People's Exhibit number 16? Um, Periodically, I've, I've looked through okay. through his screen. All right. And um, I, I want to go back to reasons for which the defendant would be allowed out of his cell. Um, what is the rec time situation at the jail right now? Currently, rec is suspended. Because, and why is that? Because of COVID. So we, we suspended rec in its entirety, I want to say, right, right before Christmas. And we have not reinstated rec collectively across the board for our facility yet. Okay. Prior to the rec time being suspended, was the defendant offered any recreational time? As far as my recollection was, he was. Do you know if he participated in that rec time? I don't think he did, if, if my memory was right. Okay. Is it fair to say that inmates can refuse to participate in rec time? Yes. Can, part can inmates refuse to take a shower? Yes. In fact, did the defendant in this case, did he refuse to take a shower for a period of time? Yes. Does the defendant have access to any educational opportunities? Yes. How so? Um, there's an inmate tablet system and on the inmate tablet system, there's there's different resources, and one of the resources available is education K through 12 education through Khan Academy. Okay. Now let's talk about this tablet. How like, how does the defendant request usage of that tablet? He just asks a deputy. 
and the deputy will provide him with a tablet. Okay, is that tablet specific to him or is it shared amongst other inmates? It's shared amongst other inmates. And is there a time usage, meaning is he only allowed the tablet for say an hour a day or 10 minutes a day? Um, as far as I know, there's not a, a like a 10 minute time limit. There, there is a time limit um, based on demand. So if there's several requests in that area, we may only have a handful of tablets, then we have to divide them up equally. Um, but I haven't heard that that's been a problem, at least in the jail clinic. Okay, now on the educational portion on this tablet, um, what service or app is offered? Con, Con Academy. Con Academy. Mm -hmm. And what other apps are listed on this tablet? There's, there's stuff for books, movies, there's a thing for like a personal calendar, there's something to view his, his mail, photographs, um, to send a kite, to uh, grievances, law library, I think that may be. All right, now as an administrator, are you able to track his activity on that tablet? I'm able to go in and look to see what, what he's looked at or what he's participated in. Um, there's just some things based on the platform that I'm not able to. Okay. But, um, and prior to arriving here today, were you able to um, determine whether or not the defendant has accessed the Khan Academy application on the tablet? I was not. Okay. And actually, I, I probably should clarify, this tablet is shared amongst other inmates, correct? Correct, but, but each person has their own personal sign-on. Thank you. That's what I was trying to get to. <clears throat> Has the defendant been able to access any games or email? Yes, I'm sorry, um, I forgot to, to mention. They, there is games and there is a mes messaging component to this as well. Okay, now, let's talk about the games first. How are these, who determines what games are on this tablet? Um, when, when we entered into a contract with Smart Communications, um, they sent us a, a host of games and someone in the agency vetted those games and made a determination that they're appropriate and along with the movies and whatnot. So so, so that, that was included in the tablet. Build so up. these games that are on this tablet, are they specific for this defendant or are they available to any other inmate in the jail? They're available to any other inmate in the jail. Now again, specifically, as an administrator, were you able to determine if the defendant has accessed any games through his tablet? Yes. Were you able to determine if he's read any books through his tablet? I, I don't recall seeing books. Okay. Do you have any knowledge of whether or not he has read any books at all since he's been um, confined at the Oakland County Jail? My understanding is that, that he's read some Harry Potter books that were given to him from the um, library. Um, but specifically other titles, not off the top of my head. Okay. You also mentioned that the defendant is able to receive mail. There's two types of mail, is that correct? There's email and then what we would traditionally call a snail mail, is that correct? So, yes. The, the email's not like I can send a, a, an email to anybody in this room. There, there's a specific process that that has to happen. Can you explain that process? So the, the process is that he has to send an invitation <clears throat> to, let's say, yourself. You in return would say yes, you would accept that, and then you would have to contact IC, IC, or excuse me, Smart Communications and create an account. And then at that point, the billing would go back and forth. There's a cost for this messaging and these, these connections. Okay. Now, is the defendant able to receive messaging from individuals from whom he doesn't know? Yes. And how does that happen based upon the example you just gave? I guess I'm a little confused. Let, let me, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, he, there, there's a vetting process that, that's put in place and in theory that, that should not have, that should not happen. 
So I, I apologize. That was my no. That's okay. Sorry. So the vetting process. Can you explain what that vetting process is? Um, it's it's basically just a, a ver verification and a um, and then with um, smart communications, um, an account is set up and there's you know payment that's available and then they allow that to occur and yes what is a commissary account captain vita commissary account is um, um mr crumbly will have what we call a trust account and then the trust account is like a bank account a checking account and one of the things in the jail that they can do is they can purchase commissary and what exactly is commissary commissary is anything from um, paper to shampoo to different sources of food, um, you know, chips, stuff like that, like a canteen. Okay. When the defendant arrived at your facility on December 1st, did he have any money in his commissary account? My, my recollection was is he did not. Okay. Does the defendant have money on his commissary account? today? Yes. In regards to the amount of money he has in his commissary account, how would you classify that um, in relationship to the other inmates at the facility? It's pretty excessive. I'm sorry, you said pretty excessive? Pretty excessive, yes. Who's able to put money on his commissary account? Pretty much anybody. What, if anything, has the defendant purchased with the money in his commissary account? To my knowledge, um, paper, pencils, deodorant. Is there any limit to what he can purchase, meaning as long as it's within the, the, the items available to purchase? Correct. No, there's not. In fact, does the defendant have any restrictions at all since he's been at your facility? No. Does he have phone privileges? He does. Besides being able to watch movies on the tablet, does he have access to any other um, devices that have a screen? There's a TV just adjacent to his cell. Is he able to control that TV? No. Who controls that TV? The deputy does. Is the defendant allowed professional visits, meaning either from clergy, attorneys, or professional visits from a therapist or psychiatrist? Yes. If necessary, is, if necessary, would he be provided medical treatment? Absolutely. Who, if anyone, does an inmate, or excuse me, who, if anyone, does this defendant have contact with? He, he would have contact with, of course, deputies. He would have contact with medical staff, um, including his uh, psych doctor, um, case, case worker. Um, that's pretty much it. Maybe someone who came and delivered his commissary to him, um, but I can't, can't think of anybody else. In, inside the jail, and then of course his attorneys when, when they want to visit him. Now again, his cell is located within the clinic area, correct? Correct. Is that clinic area open 24 hours? It is. Is there someone always at the nurse's station? Usually, yes. Let's talk about the defendant's meals. How are his meals delivered to him? Um, Usually, a deputy will bring them to him. Okay. And initially, was there a concern about his his food or lack thereof, his food intake? Yes, there was. And what was that? Um, th there was there was a concern because he he um, dropped his body weight, and the the jail clinic, in conversations with Airmark came up with an alternative meal plan for him to get him to eat because the analysis was that he just wasn't consuming his food. 
And it sounds like that is something that the the jail took upon themselves to make that change. Is that correct? You're correct. Since the defendant has been housed in your facility, have there been issues or concerns brought to your attention regarding whether it's his um, his cell upkeep or um, his food or any any other reason, any other thing? Um, the the only thing that I, that I recall was, um, you know, of course, the discussions about his food. Um, I haven't been alerted to anything real significant through the casework staff. Um, there, we, we had to move him from one cell to the next because there was a concern about um, what he was doing or, or if he was able to access something which they found you know the ceiling was missing so we had to you know move him over but but short of that okay. one moment your honor sure Captain Vida, due, the, due to COVID, let me ask, are the inmates supplied some type of cleaning supplies by any chance? Yes. And was the, was the defendant supplied those cleaning supplies? He, he has the ability to ask for them at any time. We don't, because he's in a single cell, we don't house them or, or give them directly and let them keep them in that cell. And to the best of your knowledge, Captain Vida, are the defendant's needs being met since he's been housed at the Oakland County Jail? I'd say absolutely. No further questions. Thank you. May the attorneys and Captain, if you could approach, please. Good afternoon. Hi. If I ask you something that you don't understand, just let me know and I'll try to ask it a different way, okay? Yes, ma'am. Um, what is the maximum occupancy of the Oakland County Jail? 1,100 and some change. Do you know how many inmates you currently have housed? 931 as of this morning. Now, you stated um, that it was kind of a team decision when Mr. Crumbly was brought to your facility uh, to place him on a constant watch. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And you stated that, that the purpose of that is to establish a baseline behavior. You obviously don't know the inmate. You know that his charges obviously are serious ones, but you don't know his day-to-day -day behavior. Fair to say? It's fair to say. And he was on this constant watch until about halfway through January of 2022, correct? Yes. Okay. The records indicate that the, the log sheet stops on January 14th of 2022, and I think that's the one from constant watch. So is it fair to say around that time he was taken off constant watch? Yes, January 14th, I believe. Okay. And who made that decision? Was it, again, a team decision to take him off of the constant watch? It was. So that's not something that the caseworker can decide herself? Um, the case the caseworker can make recommendations. Okay. While he was on constant watch, he was not able to uh, purchase commissary, correct? You're correct. So he's only been able to purchase commissary since being taken off of constant watch? Correct. Okay. And he is now on something called behavioral watch, is that correct? Correct.
right. And you were asked by the prosecutor um, if you were made aware of any issues um, involving Mr. Crumbly, and I believe that you stated the only issues that you could really remember were was the food issue, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, if an inmate was having behavioral issues, was not listening to deputies, um, was doing things that were prohibited, is that something that would be placed in either the constant watch logs or some other log that the jail keeps? Yes. All right, I want to talk about, um, well, let me back up. You stated that there is one other juvenile currently housed at the Oakland County Jail, is that correct? Correct. Okay. And um, there is no contact between that juvenile and Mr. Crumbly, correct? Well, their, their cells are right next to each other. Okay. Um, are they allowed to interact with each other? Not like this. I mean, they can, they can talk through their cell. I mean, they're, they're right next to each other, so they can probably stand at their cell door and talk to one another. Okay. Is that something that would be encouraged or discouraged by the deputy? We wouldn't encourage that. So besides leaving the cell to have an, uh, a visit with uh, his attorneys in the eye block or taking a shower or going potentially into a clinic room, Mr. Crumbly is in his cell 24 hours a day, correct? Correct. Okay. You stated that recreation for the entire jail was suspended in December. Do you remember when in December? It was right around Christmas. Okay. So if Mr. Um, you stated that Mr. Crumbly was offered some sort of recreation, but he declined that? Correct. Would that be noted in any of his jail records? It should be in IMAX. Okay. So if you were to reinstate recreation, how would the recreation uh, be achieved for Mr. Crumbly since he has to obviously be kept away from adults? He would go to recreation by himself. Okay. And what does that look like? It's a gym, it's a room, it's... It's a gym. Is there any um, idea when recreation will begin or are you still trying to figure out the COVID situation? We're, we're hoping to have a, a firmer idea probably in about another week as if the COVID numbers decrease. Um, was there any staffing shortage at the jail due to COVID? Sure, yes. Do you know how many deputies are employed actually at the jail? Um, roughly 250. I want to talk about um, the cell that Mr. Crumbly is housed in. So mm -hmm. you described it as completely cement except the front part which is glass, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, is there a reason that the light is kept on 24-7, the light directly above his bed? It's, it's in a medical unit, it's a high visibility cell. So that is not something that can be turned off. It just it's it's constantly it's, daylight, correct? It's constantly daylight. Okay. And he does not have a window to like the outside, is that correct? Correct. Now, the clinic that he's housed in, it is still used as an actual clinic for other adult inmates, correct? Correct. So there are adults that come in and out of that clinic, just not in and out of the defendant's cell, fair to say? Well, they, they come in from a totally different area than where the defendant is, so he wouldn't have contact. Okay. The prosecutor uh, asked you some questions about um, money that was deposited into his account, and you stated that he has a significant balance. Um, Mr. Crumbly has no control over who deposits money into his account, correct? Correct. Okay, so if someone was someone that he didn't like was to deposit money, it's not as though he can say no thank you and that money would be returned, correct? You stated that there is a TV that he could potentially see from his cell but that he doesn't have the ability to control it, correct? Correct. Um, Currently in the jail, I, I know that there was some COVID issues in the kitchen. Are the inmates receiving hot food or cold food? Cold food right now. Thursday, that's supposed to change. And what does cold food consist of? It, it can consist of 
sandwiches to MREs. MREs are like military grade? Correct. Um, due to his age, obviously, um, adolescent boys especially require a higher calorie diet than an average inmate. Um, has any, anything been done to achieve making sure that Mr. Crumbly is able to take in the appropriate amount of calories per day? My understanding through Aramark, which is our uh, meal contractor, that in consultation with our dietitian, the meal that is being provided to him meets that caloric intake as well as they provide him um, what they call an adolescent meal, which is, a, which is a supplement that, it's like a snack bag supplement with milk and fruit and stuff with his meals. Okay. So the answer is yes. I have no further questions, but I believe Ms. Hopp may have a few. Thank you. Thanks, ma'am. Ms. Hopp. Thank you. Captain, you would agree that the Oakland County Sheriff's Department has custody and control of Ethan at this time, correct? Yes. And you have since December 1st of 2021, correct? Yes. Now, um, are you aware of the laws concerning education of juveniles in the state of Michigan? Yes. And you're aware that um, you're required to um, have him attend school daily, correct? Objection, Your Honor. Um, at this time, I, at, at this time, I, I'm, I don't believe that the jail is responsible, and I believe that's pursuant to the statute. I, I understand that we're proceeding on the 1101B3, but um, quite frankly, I don't, I, I think that's an improper question because pursuant to the statute, the jail is not responsible for his education. Response, Ms. Hutt? He said he was aware of the law. I asked, was he aware that they had the responsibility? He's either aware or he's not. I agree. And that was the question. Thank you. I agree. Sir, you may answer to the extent that you are actually aware and you have personal knowledge. With that being said, Ms. Hutt, if you could re-ask your question. Sure. Certainly, Your Honor. Are you aware that the jail, not you personally, um, as a person or entity having control and charge of a person between the ages of 16 and 18 is required to provide daily education. My understanding of it is, is yes, that we are responsible with specific parameters and we've, we've gone through those and we're currently still working through that. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, is the jail certified or qualified under Michigan law as an alternative education program? Not for juveniles. How about a strict discipline academy? I'm not familiar with what you're discussing, point for bringing. How about a school of excellent, excellence organized as a cyber school? No. And do you have any teachers, certified teachers on staff or accessible to you to come in and teach school to your juvenile inmates? Not for juveniles, no. And you <laughs> mentioned this Khan Academy program that is on the tablet, correct? Correct. Are you aware that that's a supplemental to normal schooling program that doesn't count towards a diploma or any type of a degree and is not accredited? No. Uh, have you ever used it? I have not. Um, so you don't know that the schooling is, you know, five, seven, ten minute videos about a certain school subject, correct? I have not used it. And you don't know that it doesn't have any sort of high school literature or English program, correct? Um, it was my understanding that it does, but... Okay. Um, and that's on the iPad that's shared, correct? It's not an iPad, it's a tablet. A tablet, yes. sorry. Yes. Tablet. 
Um, and would Mr. Crumbly have access to that tablet for say eight hours a day? He, he would have access to that tablet. I can't say verbatim that it's an eight hour block of time that he would have, but he would have access to it for a significant amount of time. And you said the time was limited though, correct? I said it could be limited based on what the demand is. Now, have you or anyone under your direction um, met with Mr. Crombley to show him how to use that program? I personally have not. And you've not directed anybody to do that? I personally have not. So you don't even know if Mr. Crumbly can access that program, do you? Um, it's right there in the tablet with all the other options that are available. So if I press that on the tablet and get a message that says, error, you cannot connect, you wouldn't know about that. Well, then I would, I would assume that he would bring that problem up to a deputy so we can have that addressed. Now, other than you, is there anyone else that monitors his tablet usage? Um, I, can't, I can't unequivocally answer that question. I don't know. And if he were to be able to access this program and had questions about the schooling or education provided in the Khan Academy program, uh, are, are there any resources there for him to get answers to questions he may have? I'm not familiar enough with the Khan Academy. Have you been in communication or to your knowledge anyone on your staff or at your direction with any school district to supply him instructional materials, supplies, textbooks, assignments, things like that to uh, fulfill the Michigan requirements regarding education. Our corporation council has been involved in this. Anybody specifically? Yes. And who would that be? Marianne Yerge. And pursuant to those conversations, other than this tablet program, to your knowledge, nothing has been provided to Ethan for education purposes, correct? You're correct. And so as he sits there in jail, he's not getting any sort of high school credit toward a diploma, correct? <clears throat> not at this given moment, no ma'am. No further questions, thank you. Thank you. That you just mentioned he's in with the light that's on 24 seven. Are all of the cells there that would house a juvenile, they all have the same lighting issue or are there cells he could be in where he doesn't have a light on 24 seven? And, and that row of cells, those lights are those lights are fixed, they stay on. Is that the only place he can be in there? At this point, at this time, yes. When <laughs> he was on that constant watch and couldn't have commissary, which sounds like it would be math wise about six weeks or so. Okay. Have access to toothbrush, toothpaste, shampoo in the jail unless you can pay for it, you don't have it? No. That, that's factually incorrect. Well, that's the question I'm asking. Yeah, so, so, so no, we, we would provide toothbrush, toothpaste, um, soap. Um, so all those things are provided. The, the necessities to It's not for part hygiene. of commissary. Correct. Because you had testified earlier the toothpaste and toothbrush would be in commissary. So the basic I, stuff they get. I didn't testify to that. What, right. what, I, what I said was that th those are options to, to purchase. There's hygiene items that are available for for hygiene items such as that, for, for people that don't have access to commissary, we, we hand out upon intake as well as replace upon request. Okay. Well, and I don't think, I didn't mean to offend you, I don't, that wasn't clear then, just basically okay. said commissary. And so if somebody can't afford anything there, at least the basic necessities of hygiene yes, is given to them, regardless Absolutely. of how much or how little money is in their commissary. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. And soap is one of those elements, correct? Yes, ma'am. Is there towels? Uh, are towels yes. provided and then, yes. I assume, picked up and go to laundry or whatever? Yes. They get a towel a day or? No. Um, 
I believe it's once a week and they do their linen exchanges with their uniforms. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I did have a question, Captain. He's currently under a behavior watch. Is yes. there any indication of how long this behavior watch would last or could last? Um, probably just just based on um, what what our circumstances are and who he is and the high profileness of it that we would maintain that for a while. And that's nothing abnormal when we have high profile inmates. Um, we we maintain what we call, you know, the, these behavioral watches, or for other circumstances as well. But okay. I hope I answered that for you. You did. Thank you, sir. Based on that, I know you had finished your question. Any follow-up questions based on my questioning? No, Your Honor. To defense, and I know you all have rebuttal. Any rebuttal? Your Honor, I just have a few things I would like to clarify. Sure. Captain Vida, mm -hmm. to the best of your knowledge, Ethan's parents are still his legal guardians, correct? Yes. Hence, they would still be responsible for his education, correct? Correct. Regardless of their incarceration status or not. Correct. In regards to the tablet usage, the defendant has been able to access games, correct? Correct. He's been able to access his emails, correct? His messaging, yes, ma'am. He's been able to access his mail that is scanned in, correct? Correct. And all that is on the same platform as the Khan Academy, correct? Correct. You were very specific when you said the meal that is provided to the defendant. So I want to talk about the meal that is being provided to him. Is he getting the same meal as other defendants in the Oakland County Jail? No, he's receiving a kosher meal. Is that also a cold meal or some other type of meal? Right now it's a cold meal. But that kosher meal is separate and distinct from the meals that the other inmates are receiving, correct? You're correct. Are other inmates receiving an adolescent pack? Um, just the other juvenile okay. that's housed under jail. And why is the defendant in the role, referring specifically to the question that um, Ms. Deb McKelvey asked regarding um, the defendant's cell and the light that's on, and I believe you testified it's because of the role or the cell that he's currently um, assigned to. Why is he assigned to that role? He's assigned to that role um, specifically because of, because of his status as a juvenile and it's sight and sound separation from adult prisoners. Captain Vida, has the Oakland County Jail ever detained a school shooter? No. Is it fair to say that you that as a facility you're still working out the details? Yes. Are you concerned at all about the defendant's safety while he is in the care and custody of your facility? Absolutely not. I have nothing further. Thank you. I do just have just a follow up. Very briefly. Of course. Thank you. You were, you testified earlier that you were able to log on and see that Mr. Crumbly was ac accessing games and other things, but you were not able to verify that he was actually logging on to Khan Academy, correct? You're correct. Okay. Um, you were just asked, uh, has there ever been a, a school shooter that's been housed there? Um, currently, there's people charged with multiple counts of murder, rape, armed robbery, and other serious life offenses. Fair to say? Sure. Okay. Nothing further. Thank you. Thank you. Any reason why this witness should not be excused? None, Your Honor. None, Your Honor. Thank you, sir. You may step down. You are excused for today. Please don't talk about your testimony with anyone. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, Please you. return to the box here. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you. People, you have any further witnesses? No further witnesses, Your Honor. Thank you. And Ms. Lawson, do the defense have any witnesses? We have no witnesses, Your Honor. Thank you. And I will, as mentioned earlier, we had a brief status conference um, earlier this morning. As you all know, under the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Convention Act, the act requires for me to give my decision in writing. And so I'm going to take this matter under advisement issue my decision hopefully by the beginning of next week. In the meantime, I'm going to allow the parties to file supplemental briefs 
my understanding is that there's additional information um, that either party may want to present to the court. It's not required, but you may. It's an invitation. If you do want to submit supplemental briefs, it, they are due on Friday by 4 p.m. And specifically supplemental briefs as it has to do with the defendant's placement. Anything else from either party? Your Honor, would the court allow us to give a brief closing argument with regard to the evidence that you do have before you in the form of the exhibits as well as the testimony that you've heard today? Yes, very briefly. Thank you. Thank you. And you may proceed, Ms. Collins. <clears throat> Thank you. Your Honor, the defendant committed a calculated, premeditated mass murder upon other juveniles in a structured school setting. Placing defendant at a juvenile detention facility, a child care facility, as it was couched by the witness, Ms. Calcaterra, today, such as Children's Village, a setting surrounding him with other juveniles, not to mention at-risk juveniles, would be entirely inappropriate and against the interest of justice. The Oakland County Jail has and will continue to provide a safe and appropriate placement for defendant while ensuing, ensuring safety for the defendant himself, the children currently housed at Children's Village, and the public at large. As my colleague Ms. Washington mentioned earlier, the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act requirements make federal funds available for states that plan for and implement various procedures regarding the detention and confinement of certain juveniles. That is what is implicated in the form of this hearing. The finding that defendants should be housed in the Oakland County Jail has been made pursuant to Michigan's statutes and uh, court rule previously by Judge Karniak at the district court. And it is only federal funding considerations that implicate this hearing. In order for the court to review whether it remains in the best interests of justice to continue his placement at the Oakland County Jail. Now this court has been presented with multiple exhibits to review in order to get a glimpse behind the curtain at the true essence that is this defendant and the risks he presents. You have before you a 15 year old with the sophistication and the capability to plan out and execute a large scale school shooting. And the evidence presented to you during this hearing shows a deeper and more calculated mind than any typical 15 year old. His ongoing text with another juvenile, which you'll find in the exhibit book, um, arguably a kindred spirit to the defendant, delve into the depths of the defendant's mind and give us a glimpse of what he is capable of thinking, what, is he, what he is capable of concealing, and what he is capable of doing when he is ready. The sampling of text messages you've been provided between defendant and his friend date back to February of 2021 and they reveal much about the defendant and certainly should compel your honor to be very concerned about placing this defendant in a relatively less secure setting with juveniles and certainly one which mirrors in so many ways the scene of his original crime. The defendant himself tells you through his own words when you read his text that he should not be moved from the security and oversight of the Oakland County Jail. In some of his texts, he tells his friend he's so glad they can talk to one another and not be afraid to let their, quote, masks slip, end quote. That defendant, uh, that defendant appreciates that his friend is, again, I'm quoting, like the one person who is as fucked as me and shares it, end quote. He goes on to explain that, and I quote again, in public, you have to put on a mask to blend in, end quote and how they, they, in their friendship, have gotten to a place where they've shared their individual darknesses. And according to the defendant, quote, we aren't afraid to let our masks slip to each other, end quote. Defendant goes further to say the scary thing is, I like being this fucked up. And that's the end of one of his text threads and one of his quotes to his friend. That is the person, that is the kind of person that we are contemplating putting with other juveniles who are much less sophisticated, at risk, that he would gravitate to. He talks about in his texts and then in his journal about how he wants to explore his darkness with birds that he has found, wanting to make them suffer and hear their screams. And he doesn't stop at the text. He doesn't stop at writing in his journal. He goes on to actually record videos of him doing those things. And you'll hear his voice, you will hear the suffering of the bird, and you will know that it is not just words, it's not just thoughts, but it's things that he has set about to do. 
his word that he uses is that he wants to torture those birds. You'll see the video. You will also see the picture of a separate bird that he decapitated and he writes about in his journal having taken it to school and is thrilled that he didn't get caught and finds others foolish or stupid for not catching him. He tempts others with his actions. He reveals them and the only people who had an opportunity to do anything about it, those who live with him 24 seven did nothing. If these don't amount to prior delinquent acts, I don't know what would. And that is one of the factors that this court is bound to consider. And it doesn't stop at the text, it doesn't stop at the journal. Um, in his journal, he talks uh, about uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, the videos that he makes on November 29th, the day before he executes his fellow students. And he tries to execute so many others. Uh, he makes a video about what his plans are, who he wants to kill, who he wants to kill first, the type of person. All of those details are things that he clearly, he has wrote about, he has thought about, and he sets about to do. And again, with no warning to those outside of his own home. He writes in depth in his journal about his desire to stalk, rape, and kill a fellow classmate, his plans for the school shooting, what he'll do, how he'll do it, who he will kill first, how he's putting in his plan to action. And among those steps is enlisting his own father to get him a nine millimeter gun because that particular weapon is more desirable to maximize the number of kills that he can get. He also speaks of how he'll be remembered. November 30th, 2021 was not an isolated incident for this defendant. This is someone who wants to be remembered and he has contemplated how he wants to be remembered. Not as someone who made a positive impact on society, not someone who brought something uh, good or meaningful to the table, but he wants to be compared to the likes of Hitler or Dahmer or the Parkland school shooter, using them as inspiration for actions that he sets about taking. His actions on November 30th were not impulsive. They were not accidental. They were calculated, rehearsed, and well thought out. And not just his actions, but what he wanted to achieve from them. He anticipated and wrote about his expected life behind bars with the intention that he would be remembered forever. He contemplated the pros and cons of going out in a blaze of glory, of being killed or, or, or committing suicide at the end of this all. But neither of those he expressed would satisfy his desire to be remembered forever. And his behaviors since his incarceration have not changed. They've continued to demonstrate that he hasn't altered his way of thinking. His request, on December 17th, you'll see in the exhibits uh, from the jail, his request that he, re how do I get my fan mail, my hate mail, and, and my commissary. He knows that he's going to have people who admire him and people who hate him alike, and he wants that notoriety. He communicates with others and takes the opportunity to commiserate with those who gravitate toward him and share his feelings those that commend him for his actions. Um, he takes time, and, and, and again, I'm asking the court to consider, and, and this also goes to some of the relative ability between the two uh, institutions to be able to meet his needs. You know, we've talked a little bit about the education that's offered to him. He's got Khan Academy on that tablet, as well as uh, video games, as well as books, as well as the ability to communicate with those who he wants to communicate with. And if you read through these, not only the content of his emails with people, but also the frequency with which he has access to that tablet. This is how he chooses to spend his time. He doesn't choose to spend it on Khan Academy. He doesn't choose to spend it on education. And he didn't choose to spend it on education prior to his criminal actions. Um, and, and some of the disturbing things and some of the um, telling things about these email communications, um, he, he, he's on it almost daily, and if not daily, he talks with other juveniles, other people who are of his similar age. He commiserates with them about um, you know, things that they go through and things that he's gone through. But overall, he indicates to them that it's not so bad in here. I get a TV, I get good food, the deputies are nice. He's the one who's giving a first-hand account of his experience in this jail. And it's over and over and over again. He also takes time to mention to some of his fans out there, my next 
Court date is February 22nd. Maybe you can watch it on TV. This is what he wants. He wants to be noticed. He wants us to relish in his behaviors. And if he is given the opportunity to converse one-on-one -on -one with little to no supervision, because we won't have these in writing, when he's at Children's Village, when he's talking to another juvenile in the corner of the gym, when he's talking with them at the lunch table. And that should scare all of us, and I know it scares me. This is not a person you should place in the position of having contact with and potential influence over other juveniles, much less those juveniles with, who our courts have already determined to be at risk. To place him in a school, a lunchroom cafeteria, a classroom setting with juveniles, just like he enjoyed as he planned for the day he would take off his mask and execute those classmates, is an injustice that no one should have to bear. The witnesses that you've heard from in the accompanying exhibits reveal that while both facilities offer a claimed secure option, one is far superior in handling this defendant and all that he brings to the table, and that is the Oakland County Jail. Placement in the Oakland County Jail rather than Children's Village serves the defendant himself you heard from the manager of Children's Village about concerns that she has, not only, and she has to be concerned with all of the juveniles in that child care facility. Um, she has concerns about all of the juveniles that are currently housed in that secure detention facility. She also has concerns about the defendant himself. Contrary to that, there's no concerns by Captain Vita if he's housed at the Oakland County Jail. There are no services or opportunities that he could or should receive in the juvenile facility that he is not receiving in the Oakland County Jail, including opportunities for education. Most importantly for this court, however, is that continued placement of this defendant in the Oakland County Jail is what serves the public and the interest of justice as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Collins. Ms. Lofton? Yes, Your Honor, as I stated previously, I, I understand that the charges could not be more serious against Mr. Crumbly. But again, that is not the only factor that the court must consider when deciding where the best placement is for Mr. Crumbly. Um, Ms. Collins details some of the text messages uh, that you will see as part of your exhibits. As Defense Exhibit A, you will see Mr. Crumbly around this time is texting his friend, Brady, I need help. I was thinking of calling 911 so I could go to the hospital, but then my parents would be really pissed. He details seeing things, seeing people, hearing voices, and then they disappear. He discusses telling his parents again that he needs therapy, that he needs treatment, that he needs to talk to someone, that this time he's going to tell his parents about, about the voices he is hearing. This is someone who was having, in my opinion, a mental health crisis, and no one did a thing. This is someone who had no prior suspensions or issues with his peers whatsoever. No, no prior criminal charges. We've heard today that while he was at Children's Village, there was no issues. We also heard today that when he was placed at the jail, he, as a precautionary measure, was placed on constant watch and that they wanted to establish a baseline for his behavior. We also heard he was taken off constant watch. If Mr. Crumbly was someone who did not follow directions, did not follow orders, I would assume that he would still be on constant watch. No issues of misbehavior while at the Oakland County Jail. Ms. Collins argues that Mr. Crumbly is, is maybe of higher education or, or smarts of someone that is 15 years of age. I would agree. Mr. Crumbly is a very, very smart kid. He is. But that should not then be used against him. Chil the individual that testified from Children's Village was very clear that her facility is a secure facility. That there are things in place there that if they have concerns about an inmate's safety, that they can place them on a type of watch um, or security measure that keeps them from having the availability to have pencils. Well, we heard from uh, Lieutenant Vita today, Mr. Crumbly has pencils and there's been no issues with the pencils that he has. But at Children's Village, if they really had those concerns about Mr. Crumbly, they have a procedure in place to make sure nothing happens. 
Again, when these offenses were committed, Your Honor, um, my client was hallucinating. Seeing things and hearing voices, he was not sleeping. That is detailed in these text messages. He was extremely anxious, and he had no one in his corner to get him the therapy that he so desperately needed. We have been able to visit him, I think between the three of us, probably close to 20 times. Has he adjusted to life in the jail? He has. Do I think that that's the best place for him? I absolutely do not. He is completely isolated. And for someone who has mental health issues, isolation is horrific. He is in that cell 24 hours a day, except if he is leaving the cell to visit us or to take a shower. Lieutenant Vita was very clear in relation to the education aspect. He can't say if Mr. Crumbly has logged on to Khan Academy or not. The emails uh, that Ms. Collins mentioned, Your Honor, these are emails from strangers all around the world that send Mr. Crumbly emails. These are not individuals that Mr. Crumbly went looking for or that he knew. These are individuals, mostly women, who have taken it upon themselves to message him and give him well wishes and message him extremely frequently. Um, I would say that at Children's Village, we would be able to control that communication. Um, as a 15 year old, obviously being in the jail, he doesn't have a parent saying, who are you talking to? It's kind of free and, and it's a free for all really. Anyone in the entire world could message Mr. Crumbly if they set up an account. So again, Your Honor, I would ask you, uh, when you review all of those exhibits, to look at the statute and look at the factors that are enumerated by the JJDPA. Um, and I believe that after the testimony today and after a review of the exhibits that will be presented to you, I do think that the appropriate placement for Mr. Crumbly is at Children's Village. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. Lofton. And no need for rebuttal. Um, again, the court... Your Honor, do I get to argue? Just with this hearing, I don't need an additional argument really to consider. Um, I am going to allow the attorneys to file supplemental briefs. And so if there's supplemental information uh, that you all want to put in the brief, please add it to the brief. Um, as we had a brief conference here at the bench, I know that we're coming up against time here, and I would hate to have to bring everyone back another day to finish argument. So for those reasons, if, any, if you have additional argument, please enter it into your supplemental brief. And again, supplemental briefs are due February 25th, 2022 by 4 p.m. With that being said, there's also the information. I am in receipt of a binder. Parties have stipulated to a few exhibits, quite a few exhibits, um, that the court also needs to review in making its decision. With that being said, anything else from the people? Not at this time, Your Honor. Thank Th you. Thank you. Anything else from defense? Your Honor, I do not believe that we have a return date. Obviously, we are waiting on a criminal responsibility report, but I don't believe that there is any forthcoming date uh, on the schedule. That is correct. I will enter the date in the opinion and order once I draft it, determining because once I, I have to make a decision if he's going to stay in the jail. If, he, <clears throat> if I make the decision to transfer him to the Children's Village, there's no need for a review hearing every 30 days. Sure. Um, however, if I make the decision to keep him in the jail, then there's going to be a need for a review hearing. So de depending on how I rule, that information will be contained in the opinion and order. Understood. Thank Anything you. Anything else from either party? No, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you, deputies. You may take Mr. Crumbly. Thank you, deputies. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Your Honor. And if you all want to wait for these orders, I'll go ahead and sign them right now. Thank you. You're very welcome.